The meeting is now reconvened to open session. The board would like to remind the public that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. It is also available via live stream for the public through links found on the front page of the RUSD website. We would also remind everyone to please enter and exit through the lobby. And we will now, um, Trustee Price, have a report of action taken in closed session. Thank you. The board took action to join other school districts in the pending social media litigation. The, vo the vote was unanimous. In closed session, the board voted to approve issuance of charges for dismissal against permanent certificated employee pursuant to Education Code 44932, 44934, and 44938. The vote was unanimous. And last one, in closed session, the board voted to approve Leslie Holmes for the position of Director of Special Education and Support Programs. The vote was unanimous. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, we're just having a pass along. That part. <laughs> All right. Uh, Zalalis. <laughs> We'll go with Callista. So tonight we have Callista from Victory High as our student board rep. Callista, will you please introduce the color guard and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Whitney High School Air Force Junior ROTC color guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. The commander and U.S. flag bearer for this evening color guard is the cadet captain Clay. The state flag is carried by Cadet Captain Bailey Newman. The right guard is Cadet Master Sergeant Sophia Burkhalter. The left guard is Cadet First Luent Lieutenant Kevin Lugana, Lug oh my God, Laguna. The alternate today is Cadet Slash Airman First Class Ryan Manning. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And now we'll move on to item 5.1, RUSD Family Partners in Education. Um, our special recognition and presentation portion of the meeting, Chief Dosange, will you please introduce our Family Partners in Education recognition tonight? Good evening, President Hupp, trustees, and Superintendent Stock. The Families Partner in Education is an opportunity for the Rockland Unified School District to recognize family engagement and involvement to help our students achieve excellence during the school year. For tonight's Families Partners Education, re education Recognition, we have Associate Superintendent Dr. McDonald recognizing um, the Sunset Ranch Elementary School's family, the McDonald family. Good evening, Board of Trustees. Um, I'm sorry to be here with you this evening, um, but Principal uh, Kircher unfortunately had a family emergency and will not be able to attend. However, as the former principal of Sunset Ranch, I have the pleasure of introducing, uh, not coincidentally, the McDonald's, who are an amazing family. So I'd love for the McDonald's to come up and join me now. Please give them a round of applause. And at least two of the, these big kids here, uh, Benicio and Gabriela, were at Sunset Ranch during my tenure, so I feel like I'm qualified. But um, great family, and this is from Principal Kircher, so I know she appreciates you and wishes she could be here. Uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to highlight and honor our family partner in education from Sunset Ranch Elementary School. While there are many families that do so much for our school, the Coyote family partner being recognized this evening is especially deserving of this recognition. It is my honor to introduce the McDonald family to you and now kindly ask you, uh, now ask them to join. Here we go. First, we have former Coyote uh, Benicio. There you go. Raise your hand, Benicio. 
who is now a ninth grade wildcat at Whitney High. He started his school career in Rockland Unified at Sunset Ranch in 2014. Then we welcome Gabriella, also a former coyote, who is now a seventh grader at Granite Oaks Middle School. Although before my time at Sunset Ranch, they both, Benicio and Gabriella, continue to be remembered by all staff for being driven, responsible, kind, and hardworking, all the traits you would wish for a student to demonstrate. Next, Dominic, a current fourth grade student at Sunset Ranch, whom I have personally gotten to see flourish. Dominic is exceptionally responsible and a wonderful example of what it means to be a coyote. Great job, Dominic. He serves on the student council as a leader of the pack and also consistently demonstrates leadership qualities in the classroom. Excellent. And last but not least, the wonderful parents of these great kids, Eherin and Bianca. This family has been so much a part of the school community with a commitment to all, but most impressively to one another. Um, now I'm starting to feel like a, 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 it's a ceremony here. Okay. <laughs> um, this explains why they're all so remarkable, as they are a reflection of the love and time they invest in their relationships. We are so appreciative of not only the support they've provided over the last eight years for not only their own children, but for all students at Sunset Ranch. Bianca is always available to help in any way, big or small. She has been a consistent member and volunteer with our Parent Teacher Club. She has been especially helpful in honoring our teachers uh, for teacher appreciation and definitely shows our staff how much she truly values all that they do. In addition, she has fully taken on our yearbook creation for the last two years, wow. If you've ever been part of a, a scrapbooking page or a shuffle, uh, Shutterfly project, you know how incredibly detailed and patient you must be as well as devoted to the tremendous time it takes to create them. Therefore, you can imagine that the yearbook is this work times 100. Bianca has even uh, been the school photographer when needed and has taken it upon herself to go the extra mile to customize each classroom page with designer qualities. She goes above and beyond to capture and curate the best moments of our school events and culture. Beyond her creative flair, she is a steadfast, guaranteed person presence on our campus. She volunteers to help in the classroom weekly, rain or shine, and no matter what life throws at her. One of our teachers shared that Bianca is the most positive and uplifting person that she knows. And Ehren, there is a, pro, there is a pause, and I'm adapting it quite a bit, that behind every successful person, there is a partner. And although we don't get to have your presence here on campus at Sunset Ranch, like Bianca, we know your support is a huge contribution to your wife and children, and therefore to all of us at the school. Thank you, McDonald family, for being the kind of people we are so very lucky to partner with. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank Congratulations. All right. So this is the best part, because right here, this kid is my neighbor. They live right next door. This is the best part. This is one of those, again, a great family that lives in Rockland that does everything. They're amazing. They're always helping out. They're always up at Sunset Ranch. I know both of you guys are going to get recruited at Whitney. They're probably talking to you already at, at Granite Oaks, but when you roll over to Whitney, Collins is going to start talking to both your parents about having them come up. And there's only time, but it's all ready to go. So, again, they help out, always volunteering, always doing a part. And, again, not only at the school, in the community, everything they do. So, again, one of those great families, love them as a neighbor, always there to help out, always there to help out anybody in the community, at the schools. Um, if he's not driving, she's driving one of these kids somewhere, and there's multiple other kids in the neighborhood that are hopping in that car to get somewhere, to go to an event, to be at every place. So, again... Again, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you guys do. Thank you for being a great neighbor. Thank you for being a great community people. And we'll talk about getting a haircut at some point. Okay, bud? <laughs> <laughs> so, hang on to that.
All right, awesome, thank you. We'll now move on to the employee recognition portion. Uh, Chief Dosange, will you please introduce our employee recognition tonight? President Hupp, trustees, and Superintendent Stock, tonight for our employee recognition, we have Victory High School Principal, Mr. Scott Hutton, joining us to introduce Paul Rettenhouse, who works hard to encourage students to think critically, work collaboratively, to grow academically. Good evening, Pres President Hupp, trustees, Superintendent Stock, this is my colleague, and more importantly, my good friend, Paul Rettenhouse. And if you haven't had the pleasure to know Paul before, I can tell you that Rockland Unified is retiring one of its finest. That is most certain. He has spent the last 22 years, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, the last 22 years educating our young adults and the last 17 in Rockland Unified, specifically at Victory High School. That kind of dedication and commitment is unparalleled. And when you think about our clientele sometimes, He's working with some of the most at-risk students, and when you, you'll hear some of the testimonial from our, our students, and I can tell you that year over year, the sentiments, I can see Calista nodding her head, the sentiments are exactly the same. So let me just tell you a little bit more about Paul, and hopefully this is okay for you, all right? So you may have heard me joke before that an alternative education center, our alternative education center, the only constant is really change. But no matter what, Paul is consistent in his delivery of sentiment, kindness, compassion for his students. Those that come to Victory High School do so for a variety of reasons, yet regardless of their situation, he takes the time to understand their individual learning styles, what motivates, the talents that they have, and more importantly, their passions, because that is so important, as you well know. Paul's compassion and consistent practice of listening for understanding enables him to establish a rapport with his students that truly is unparalleled but it also directly correlates to a safe social emotional space, as well as a rigorous and academic learning environment. Despite being responsible for providing that rigorous curriculum and lesson content to multiple age groups, multiple grade levels, Paul maintains an environment where students think critically, they work collaboratively, and they grow academically. He is adept in identifying the appropriate support for his students and continuously provides families with the appropriate approaches to help them better learn at home. Recently, and this is my favorite part, I promise not to cry, <laughs> one of Paul's students commented to me, he said, Mr. Reddenhouse doesn't just teach his students, he takes the time to actually get to know them. I'm now a senior, so I've had many teachers in my time, but yet not one has ever known me like Mr. Reddenhouse does. And then it gets better. Another, another Victory High student shared with me, that I have been a student of Mr. Rettenhouse's for multiple classes, so I see him all the time. But every time I do, he makes me feel like I'm the most important person in the moment. And that's pretty empowering. I love it. All right, it brings a smile to my face each time I mention the fact that Paul and his wife, Joan, who has recently retired from Granite Oaks, where she served for 25 years, is that right? 23 years. It feels like... <laughs> But it brings a smile to my face every time I think about the fact that now after this year, they will be retired together. And I don't think that anybody that I know will enjoy that time more than the two of them. And I can say, Paul, with Mr. my most earnest heart, that you are going to be missed by all of us there. Appreciate so thank that. you. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. You bet. Well, thank you, Principal Hutton, for those words and letting us all know about the dedication that Paul has had to our Victory students. And I think that individual care and empathy and that stable presence is so important. And we're really um, going to miss you in our district. And so on behalf of the district and our board, I'll present you with this. And also this. <laughs> Thank you so much.
So awesome. Thank you, Paul. All right, up next, we have our Placer County Spelling Bee winners. And uh, Chief Dosange, will you please introduce our students? Three times the charm. President Huff trustees and Superintendent Stock, the Placer County Office of Education hosted the 2023 County Spelling Bee on March 15th. Two students from Granite Oaks Middle School walked away with top honors in the junior high category. Please join me when I call your name. First runner up is Audrey Zhang. And the first place winner is Rohit Jayan Kalandaival, who will also compete in the state spelling bee in May. I have to say, I am so impressed. Not only the top of our district, the top of our county, and now you're going to go on to state as well. Uh, I'm a little hesitant to ask what your winning word was, because I don't know if the board would be able to spell it. Do you want to share what your win? Okay, I thought you would want to, but I'm going to ask you to ask another trustee to spell it. Okay, go for it. What was your winning word? Ghastly. Ghastly. Okay. Ooh. Okay, ghastly. Second place is phenomenal. Do you remember what your what the word was? I'm sure you did great. So second place and first place are phenomenal. So it's great to celebrate you. Um, I have two awards for both of you. So it it is an honor to be able to be here tonight to recognize you first on behalf of the board. So the board of trustees appreciates you doing a phenomenal job. And so we just wanted to um, give you a special award, Audrey. Let's give Audrey one more round of applause. And Rohit Jan, let's give you one more round of applause. And then in addition, because you took such a phenomenal standing throughout all of Placer County, Assembly Member Joe Patterson wanted to give you a special recognition from the California State Assembly as well. So he was unable to be here tonight, but asked that we present these to you on behalf of him as well. So you have a special recognition. It is his honor to recognize your outstanding performance in the Placer County Spelling Bee. Congratulations. And we'd love to take a picture with you if we can. Can we give them one more round of applause for their great work? Thank you. You, okay, better than certificates. Come on, I can't leave out the goodies. You also get leather bees. Thank you, compliments of leather bees. One free Rachel's large Sunday. So enjoy.
All right, that is wonderful. Thank you so much. And we want to thank all families for joining us. And while you're more than welcome to stay, this is a good time to exit if you would like to. Uh, but we welcome you to stay for the rest of the board meeting. Um, so we will be moving on to our employee organizations and welcome CSEA President Chuck Haddix to present the CSEA report. Good evening, President Hupp, trustees, and Superintendent Stock. I know that we're in the month of April with May clicking at our heels and soon to be summer, but I'm standing up here before you to let you guys know that we are proudly going to sunshine our articles to you for openers and negotiations. So that's all I have. <laughs> all right. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lamos, do you want to share for a moment what that means to sunshine the articles? Yeah, and thank you, President Hub. It's really, this is the starting process of negotiations, and um, CSEA has kindly submitted theirs to the district. Uh, the process for the district will be then we go through our process of soliciting through cabinet and through administrators uh, any process for things that we may want to sunshine or to begin the negotiations. The plan is to uh, both do the presentation and hearing on the May 17th. Did I say that right? May 17th. Um, board meeting. All right, thank you. And now we will welcome up RTPA President Travis Mojet to present the RTPA report. So first off, in full transparency, I'm kind of debating taking a selfie in front of that screen so I get some of the fun round of applause. I do want to give a huge shout out to, um, I got like all my wrestling people back in the back room, my other family, so it's kind of cool because Chuck and I are usually in here with no offense to you guys, but just you guys. Um, so it's good to see other people of the community here. So um, look forward to hearing what they have to say later. Um, Derek, I'm going to challenge you with something uh, for future meeting planning. So you guys may or may not be aware, but tonight there is a benefit basketball game happening at Whitney High School, um, staff versus staff. Um, so Derek, I'm going to put it on your shoulders to make sure we don't schedule board meetings on that event in the future. Because um, I know we all would love to be there. Business has to happen, so I get it. And you know um, whose meeting was scheduled first. It, it probably was. <laughs> in full trend. It probably years, was. Yeah. It probably this was. It's on the calendar for a few, yes. But still. But we wish we were they there. They don't care I know. over there. So. I'm so bummed. <laughs> um, it would have been really fun. To but be uh, yeah, it's going to be a great event. Um, if, if you guys or the, the community isn't aware, the Games to Benefit uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, uh, Society, which we've had, definitely had staff members throughout the district that have been affected by that stuff. So it definitely hits close to home. Um, on, a, on an additional note, just an apology to HR and Matt Murphy and Patty for whatever staff has not able to make it back to work after playing tonight. Um, so um, the, we had a good intro at our staff meeting on kind of what the Whitney team expectations were, so that was fun. Um, a lot of you guys know uh, Coach Watt. He's one of our younger players on the team, and um, he's expected to score no points tonight, but to, but to control the paint, as he put it. So... Um, it was uh, it was good. So I know there'll be highlights that we'll get a chance to see in the future. But anyway, just a cool cool event happening um, with that stuff. Um, uh, back to kind of our, my real reason for being here. Um, so I just want to give a huge shout out to um, the joint bargaining teams around uh, on both sides of, of district and RTPA. Um, as you guys know, we're we're exploring with any and every new creative way to make bargaining better, more efficient, collaborative, all of the the buzzwords. Um, and this week, we dove uh, headfirst into this idea of subcommittee work. Um, and, uh, and I don't want to put words in Tony's mouth, but I think he said it was my best idea ever. Um, I may be paraphrasing or completely lying, um, but one way or the other, um, Tony and Emily and I had a chance to debrief the other day after that, uh, that meeting with our subcommittee work and just had all positive things from all members included. Um, the reason we're doing it is it gives us the opportunity to bring in experts in areas that our bargaining teams just don't represent as well as we could. Um, so for example, we spent some time on some TK conversations. So we were able to, we're lucky enough that we do have a TK teacher on our bargaining team, but carrying the weight of that by herself isn't necessarily the most fun position. Um, so we were able to bring in some feedback from members as well as additional TK member to join her in that conversation. Um, Dr. McDonald and one of our principals sat and they, they uh, for about an hour and a half, hashed out a lot of conversation um, and have a lot of good ideas moving forward that we're going to continue with. Um, at the same time, we had a, a diverse group um, in a different room working on things around our leaves article, just trying to clean up language and make, make things in that area of our contract a little more accessible and, again, collaborative with employees. And 
Um, the fun part about that conversation was we put our interest up on the board and they were almost identical um, verbatim. Um, and it's just a matter of how do we get to those interests without you know, shooting ourselves in the foot or doing things that create different problems that we're, we're not seeing. Um, and then we're gonna do some more of that work again a little bit this week. So different, different focuses with our subcommittees, but it's just really proven to be a really cool opportunity and process to just make more efficient use of our time but more importantly, to bring in the actual experts on topics that our bargaining teams aren't able to represent. Um, and it's fun to get more of the district office involved in that process, because the district team is, is smaller than ours at times, but when, when appropriate, we get to bring in, you know, ed services, business services, and whoever, so it's just kind of a, a neat approach. Um, so again, look forward to having more um, opportunity to share how that's going with you guys in the near future. Um, well, Chuck said it, we are right on the heels of May. We still have our target on having a settled contract before we go to summer, summer similar to last year. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do, but I think we, we definitely have the calendar time to do it. We have the motivation to do it, and our members definitely have made it a, a directive that they expect from us, so um, for all of the good reasons of that. So again, just want to thank you guys for empowering that process, because I know you guys have done work behind the scenes with that. Um, in addition, while we're uh, talking about positive things, a fun experience, and I'm assuming um, Superintendent Stock might speak to this, so I apologize if I'm stealing any of your thunder, but right before um, spring break, we got an opportunity to do some prize patrol work, and I don't know if he's still back there, but Matt was back there, um, and I want to uh, just share my gratitude on how the prize patrol process came together, because it was totally different this year. So prize patrol is how we go out and recognize our employees, our employees of the year um, at the district level, some of them moving on to county level and even beyond. Um, and so uh, transportation services and, and um, human resources work together and they literally put us all on a school bus. Tony brought snacks and balloons and, and plants and everything and we got to go from campus to campus and site to site around the district recognizing employees in full force and it was just a really fun and cool experience. Uh, while we were on the bus we got to grill um, transportation services on how the electric buses are going to work and, and all the fun that we keep hearing about those things so it was just really cool and if you haven't been on a school bus in a while it's just a different experience so um, it, was, it was just a fun thing to do so really enjoyed that hope it's something we can continue to do in the future. Um, and, uh, and with the Midas shutdown, it kept, it kept us all kind of together at the same time, which made it, it nice and efficient. So <laughs> I live right down the street. I'm a little bitter about that one. Um, so uh, labor work, we've been talking a lot about that. Um, we have some uh, kind of the close out the year. We have our big labor work days coming first part of next week. Um, a piece I really want to emphasize on that is um, Superintendent Stock graciously accepted an invite to join our rep council meeting on Monday evening. Um, just to be in the room and hear the feedback from our, our rep members um, on how things are going. Um, I, I'm asking them, we're asking them uh, uh, explicit questions. We're going to do the same thing and meet with our principal group the following day, uh, where uh, Roger and I get an opportunity to just be a fly on the wall and just let them have some honest conversation, share with each other, share with us what's going well, where have we hit the mark, where have we missed, where can we improve. Um, and when I pitched that to my team, they were like, game on. Like, so I think that speaks to all the work that we've done um, collectively that uh, even six months ago, the beginning of the school year, if I would have asked rep council if the superintendent should come to one of our meetings, it would not have been a popular conversation. Um, but I, again, that just goes to um, superintendent stock of just making himself vulnerable and allowing himself to become part of that culture. Um, uh, be willing to hear the criticisms, but also willing to, to call out the criticism. So um, I look forward to that opportunity. I know the rep council is eager to, to have Roger's attention. Um, and then, like I said, I'm eager to join that same conversation with our principal group the following day. And then we're going to spend an entire day with our site rep and admin teams as well. Um, so they can kind of update us on some work that we've tasked them with uh, for the year. So again, lots of great things coming, um, coming that way. I um, also want to give a, a huge shout out um, Specifically to Dr. McDonald, Superintendent Stock, um, we had some, some interesting safety concerns present themselves in the last few weeks in Rockland. And, um, and Bill specifically, and I hope I told you this enough, but if not, I'm going to tell you in front of everybody tonight, but the appreciation of the staff members that are directly impacted by that, of how you've been handling it, how seriously and attentive you've been to everything, speaks volumes on your dedication to that. So um, it's one of those things that it surprised even me how responsive and, and prepared the district was for things that presented themselves um, to ways where when I've reached out to resources to get advice and help, they're like, we've never heard or experienced something like that. And if you looked at how our people are handling that, 
it's like routine, like that we've done this before, we're prof professionals, we know how to handle it. And, um, and again, the people affected by that have expressed that multiple times to me, so I just wanna make sure that we all get to hear um, the, the deserving recognition, uh, again, especially uh, Mr. McDonald, Superintendent Stock, because they've been kind of the, the right there in the trenches with that stuff. So um, hopefully we'll get to move past that and, and the, the safety concerns will just continue around things like allergies and Kleenex and stuff for the rest of the year. So, um, and then finally, just um, a little bit of feedback, call it constructive criticism, but don't take it as overly criticism. Um, but we keep talking about collaborative process. Um, this week, a survey was sent out to collect data to try to be collaborative. The survey wasn't received well. So the survey I'm referencing was um, the board was seeking some input around some agenda items for later this evening. Um, and it was just the survey didn't have a chance to have the fidelity that I think you guys would have wanted it to have simply because of the timing. And that, that started to, to have our ranks question a little bit of are we really being collaborative or is this a process of just saying we did something? Um, so that's, that's, again, just constructive criticism, a little bit of feedback, but wherever there's an opportunity that we can collaborate, whether it's, it's you and me, Julie, as president to president, having those conversations, um, superintendent, stock and I, or ed services, or whoever it might be, um, but if we can get out in front of those things, and I do want to give a lot of credit, again, to, um, to Dr. McDonald. He reached out to me and kind of gave me a heads up, and we had the conversation of, like, we're going to do it. We need to do it. It's been asked and requested. It's information that's worthwhile, but giving ourselves only a few days to gather that kind of data is just not, the, not gonna be the data that we're hoping it probably will be. So again, just as we're talking about collaboration and things like that, making sure that we are practicing that in all areas um, that we expect our members, our students, right, our staff to do. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much. All right, now on to item 7.1, comments and report from student board representative Callista. Callista, will you please share your report? So Corey Trail is excited to announce that we were able to raise $2,267 for our Leukemia, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Bucks for Blood campaign. Corey Trail had such a great time working with the Whitney High School representatives. Corey Trail is also holding their spring book fair this week of April 24th to April 28th. The fair will be held in the library with a special family night on April 26th from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Finally, the Corey Trail PTC will be holding their first spring carnival on Friday, April 28th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Cobblestone just had a very successful jogathon with the PTC raising over $35,000. We are looking forward to replacing our 20 plus year old picnic tables with some of the funds. The weather was great. Parents enjoyed coming to cheer on our students and had a great time. PTC is also sponsoring a restaurant night at Chick-fil-A on April 25th from 4 to 8 p.m. Fantasy Theater returned to Cobblestone for an assembly featuring student written plays from the greater Sacramento area. Antelope, Antelope Creek recently partnered with the leadership students at Whitney High School and raised over $1,000 for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. We are also coming up on the annual APEX Color Run, which in the school spends a couple of weeks learning about positive character traits and raising funds for school programs. This year, the culminating APEX Fun Run will take place on 5-4-23 at AC. Finally, the annual Mini Olympics at Antelope Creek has been officially renamed by the school community in conscious honor of Beth Moore as the Beth Moore Mini Olympics. Beth was a longtime aide at Antelope Creek, and for many years she was on the main coordinator. She was the main coordinator and champion of this tradition at AAC. We look forward to this fun tradition at AAC every year in her honor and memory. Go Falcons! Parker Whitney has been practicing for our annual talent show on 420. This year, our PTC parent volunteer crafted a dynamic opportunity filled with theater foundations, lessons, and a visit from our Rockland Community Theater staff to help improve their dynamic performances. We have been exciting PTC events and dinner nights out along with our spring band performance on sorry, <laughs> May 1st. Our second NAD third graders will be visiting Bishop's Hamburger Farm, our third graders will be going to the Bernard Museum, and our fourth graders are visiting Sutter's Fort, all to enrich their classroom learning. On April 21st, um, Springview is having their One Pill Can Kill assembly. 
on May 2nd. Um, it's the first degree of separation assembly, Mental Health Awareness Month. And on May 30th, they're having Neon Prom Promotion Dance. From Rockland Alternative Education Center at Victory, the Victory Interact Club is once again putting service before self at the May 12th Hooked on Fishing event. Hosted by South Placer Rotary, our Interact Club will be teaching students from Rockland Elementary and Antelope Creek Elementary how to fish and of course have fun in the process. Also, we'd like to extend a special thanks to our friends in the districts and throughout the community for coming out to, to support our annual blood drive last month. Great job, thank you, that was a lot. <laughs> I don't feel so bad about not being able to pronounce your last name though. I don't, don't feel bad, <laughs> <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> um, all right, 7.2 comments from board and superintendent, board members, do you have any comments you would like to share? Um, it's been a busy month, I just uh, really wanted to share uh, today, I went to the Granite Oaks assembly, which I've been to several of the One Pill Can Kill assemblies. Uh, this one was a little bit unique today because this was um, Zach Didier's school. And so it was really personal, but I was really impressed with these middle school kids. That room was silent. And there was so much respect and given to the Didiers and the other parents that were sharing their experience. Um, I also personally felt really strongly about this because this age group, starting at 14, is when they're finding um, it's the fastest growing victims in that age group. So it's great that we have this information being communicated to the middle schools. They also, it's been interesting to watch these assemblies because I've seen probably three or four now, as I know you guys have as, as well, um, as they've improved them and given some kids some additional tools for what to deal with normal teenage angst and, and finding some solutions besides, besides drugs to turn to. So there are some really, really good things shared. And the last one that I wanted to share is that um, Chris today shared um, part of Zach's yearbook. And one of his comments was about um, being kind to others was an was a important priority to him. So it was a really sweet assembly, and I was really proud of our, our Granite Oaks kids and also really grateful for another opportunity for us to educate kids in Rockland about something so important. Okay, yeah, I had to kind of uh, look back at my calendar because it's been a while since we've had a meeting here. Um, but I was able to join a few events um, over the past month or so. Um, one was something I've been, you know, kind of taken part in for a few cycles now is um, the first LCAP meeting that was held here. And it was great to see a group of parents, um, many of whom I think it was their first time coming out to work on that and asked a lot of really insightful questions. And I feel really confident that they're going to provide a lot of great um, input to that end. I also was able to come out for um, the district leadership program um, that's been going on. It was the, I think maybe the last one or close to the last one, last one. Um, that was hosted by our Hannah Anderson and Bill McDonald. And it was really great to see a group of varied teachers working on their professional development and leadership growth and just overall very positive and engaging. And then, um, Trustee Sadhoff and I were recently at the assembly at Rock Creek Elementary for <laughs> Mosquito Awareness Week, um, hosted by the um, Mosquito and Vector District, and it was so fun. I have to give them extreme props for keeping that age group of kids engaged and paying attention and answering questions, and I actually learned a couple of facts myself, and got to hold a giant walking stick bug, which was not something I was expecting to do, you know, at eight in the morning, but <laughs> it woke me up. So anyway, that's what I have. 
Yeah, I don't know that I knew what I was getting into that morning either. You know, a mosquito awareness assembly. Um, it was so well run. And I have to say, kudos, I had that on my list to thank all of the Rock Creek staff. I mean, that was a fun assembly for kids to, to come out to. Um, you know, a thank you to also the Placer Mosquito and Vector Control District. Um, it was very engaging. We learned lots of new things. Michelle and I, were, or Trustee Sutherland and I were sitting by each other and finding ourselves laughing and participating participating in the assembly, um, but just a thank you to our district um, for providing opportunities like that for our students to learn more in fun and engaging ways. Um, it, it was a great community collaboration that day. Lots of leaders from the county there, lots of electeds there, and so I didn't know mosquitoes were so popular in our area, um, although they did tell us it, it's totally okay to just squash them, and I just, I don't know, I, I felt like that might hurt somebody's feelings to just be so bold about that. Um, uh, also, uh, I just wanted to I know I mentioned it as an upcoming event at our last board meeting, but I just wanted to say kudos to the team for the parent university that was put on. That was just a great night to get to walk around and see parents on our campus learning from their teachers and other experts from the area. I got to sit in on several of them. Um, the FBI agent might have scared me a little bit. Um, I had one that already went through their teenage years. I have one smack in the middle. Um, and I think we had probably the longest lesson on social media again that night. She's like, I know, Mom, what class did you go to? <laughs> um, but that was a really great night. And I just thought as a trustee, you know, a lot of times we talk about and we speak about involving parents, having parents on our campus. And I just thought that was a phenomenal approach to saying we want to connect our staff with our parents. We want to talk about issues uh, that our LCAP um, is asking us to address. Um, and so I really appreciated the staff being very intentional about that, about putting forth parent university classes that were specific to what the LCAP said um, that parents were telling us they needed help in. So thank you to our USD. Um, I look forward to seeing parent university continuing. So um, again, as everyone said, it's been pretty busy the last couple weeks, which is amazing. I will say, um, and for all of you that were there and all of you that don't go, please go when it comes around again, but the unified games at Rockland High School and watching all those kids and watching the community, watching all the kids in the school cheering, no matter what happens, where it happens, who it happens with, kids are just ecstatic, yelling and screaming. It was, it's an amazing event. So that, that's, that's a really, it's heartwarming to watch and see and to see the community come together for that. Um, second off, uh, the Shiny Apple Awards that were hosted Crystal. I have a shiny. A little shiny. Shiny or crystal. Shiny. Shiny crystal. But anyway, shiny. so it, it's amazing. Yeah, it it, it's a fun night to watch the teachers get up, and it's amazing to see the kids present an award with just compassion and sincerity to just explain how that teacher made such an impact in their life, and and to hear it from the kids straight up as they're going. It's it it brings tears to your eyes to watch it. I know it, it's really great to see, and thank you for for putting that together. Thanks to the community and 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 those. Again, it's amazing. Um, I know we're missing the admin basketball. I do have a side bet, so we'll hopefully it it, it pays off, but I'll probably lose it anyway. <laughs> and then um, over the weekend, um, and again, just from a community standpoint. Uh, there was a Whitney, High School, Whitney softball uh, golf tournament in the community for, for the uh, girls softball team. And it was really amazing to watch, to see, to go out there to play. And I'm horrible at golf, but it was fun to see kids, parents, teachers, and Scott Collins out there just chatting with each other, having a good time, and doing something for the kids. So, again, amazing. Um, I, I will say, Chuck, I, I got to give you some credit. I give, give your team some credit. Um, we were at different events, and I had multiple realtors come up and say, oh my gosh, people love Rockland, and they're all coming here, and they say, when people go out and see the schools, after all the rains, and when they all, they all say, oh my gosh, how do you keep them so new? And I was like, don't tell them that it's like, some of these places have been around 20 years, but they were like, they just look so nice, they're great, they're beautiful, and again, it's, and, and every realtor says, one of the, the one main reason that family moved to Rockland is because of the schools. And I know it's the teachers, I know it's the programs we have, but when, they, when you just drive by and see it, thank you to your team and your staff for, for keeping those places looking amazing. So, <laughs> Craig too, but. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, I will say, and then just 
Roger, I just have a question, and I know hopefully uh, it, we're still on for the end of April and that road at Midas to be repaired so we're not taking long bus routes around just so we can stop by Travis's house and wave on the way? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I knew this question may be coming and I did reach out to the city and they assure me that their uh, end of April schedule that is posted is, is on track and that the key piece of equipment related to that had arrived uh, on time and, and they are uh, working hard to, uh, to make that happen. All right, well, going last, most things have already been said, but um, I will say I am really excited about the RTPA report and um, the joint bargaining teams and committees that are being utilized. Um, everything we hear about that sounds amazing. Uh, the education that's happening on both sides is so jaw-dropping. Actually, the best jaw drop that I had this week was when I found out you invited Roger to your rep meeting. <laughs> I was like, whoa, all right, things are going well. Um, <laughs> that's fantastic. I can't wait to hear how that goes. Um, also, I just wanted to say um, good luck and our hearts are with all the teachers through the month of May. Uh, I know it's going to be a barn burner and everybody's going to do the best they can and um, We'll, we're there with you in spirit. Um, I Something that really touched me tonight was um, the presentation to Paul Rettenhouse and um, how personal the students were in what they said about him. I think the greatest compliment a teacher can get is when a student says, you see me and you make me feel special. There's nothing better than that. It's better than any grade or any test score to know that you made a child feel loved and welcome and like they belong. Um, I so enjoyed, for that same reason, the Crystal Apple Awards, um, where the students got to get up and give the awards to the teachers, which is really the flip-flop of what normally happens. And it was the teachers getting those awards and seeing them tear up. Um, it really means a lot not just to the students to know that they're seen, but also to the teachers to know that they're seen and to know that um, you're being called out for things that you do straight from your heart and you love um, was just really, really special. So um, I'll end there, although I do, I do want to say Parent University, absolutely fantastic idea. So impressed with Hannah and her team and um, all those that work to make that happen and excited to see that continue happening in the future. All right, Superintendent Stock, do you have any comments to share this evening? There are just a, a few a few pieces and again, just it was what was great to get on get on the bus literally and honor ten of our employees of the year and, and just to see that 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 uh, recognition that really is sometimes once in a career and and often we can do it in front of their colleagues, in front of their students, and just appreciate. Chuck Travis for joining us and our human resources transportation putting that together and it's um, just a, a great great thing to do um, and and then also uh, with our parent university we had an extended I was in here last night when we had a, a continuation of our love and logic class we had about 25 parents continuing on with that so appreciate trustees being a part of that work out at Whitney High School and and know that that's still still continuing um, we also, uh, in just the labor management work, you, you heard uh, Travis talk extensively about that and just was echo uh, the, the sentiments of just the opportunities to work together, to, to put more minds together to solving problems and, and to look at solutions um, it is just, just the best, best way possible. And just in, in the continuation of that collaboration uh, is, 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 is very uh, meaningful. We're, we're going to be doing some work on looking at how we can look at attendance and things together and, and just a lot of uh, continuing good work. And so very thankful for that. And we do have a lot of work. And, but really importantly, the, the Board of Trustees continued support of that effort and, and to put resources available to support the, this work, which really uh, has huge impacts in our district. And so you know, that continued support is very significant and, 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 and appreciate that. Um, another piece is sometimes we get to hear uh, about things or issues, but I think Rockland is just such a great community to work in. And an example of the partnership we have is, um, you know, I, I received information 
uh, that um, out at Whitney High School, that the Whitney Athletic Boosters Association was notified last week that they actually got a $24,945 grant from the Restore Rockland Grant Program, which is funded by the City of Rockland and the Placer Community Foundation. And that they have put those uh, dollars uh, towards several things, such as adding water bottle filling stations on campus. I think there's four that are going to be added. And they've been working with Craig Rouse, our Senior Director of Facilities, um, uh, to do that. And then also some branding projects, sound equipment modernization for the stadium and gym, and even some support for it, adding uh, girls flag football. So uh, what is great is that our, our, our athletes athletic boosters, which is our parents, of course, and then our city, working to find creative ways to bring more support collaboratively, and that's really what the best of Rockland's about. So it, w it was it's great to hear about that and see that moving forward, and just want to acknowledge the hard work of our parents out at Whitney and the booster group in our city for uh, partnering uh, with them as well. So um, uh, that is all I have, President Hub. Awesome, thank you, great news. Uh, okay, on to item 8.1, the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees, audience, or staff request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Any items removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Does anyone wish to remove an item from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action? I would like to remove item 8.16, please. Okay, so Trustee Sadoff requests to move item 8.16, you said? Okay. So is there a motion to approve the remainder of the consent agenda items? So moved. Second. Okay, first by Trustee Price, second by Trustee Counter. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Calista Zarellis? Here. Derek yes. Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Motion passes. Now, Trustee Sadoff, would you like to speak to the item removed? Yes, thank you. I wanted to pull item 816. Um, it's the action on comprehensive school safety plans for our 23-24 school year. Um, and I thought it was an important time for us to um, discuss a few items about that. And so one, I, I first want to thank the great work that our district's done. I know I sat as a parent uh, several years ago on two different school site councils, and I know the preparation of the school safety plan is a lot of work. And so I first want to thank the teachers and staff and parents that worked hard. Uh, if you haven't gotten a chance to look at the documents, every single school site has about a 90-page document um, that details their school safety plan. Um, these plans include things about crime prevention, safety for our students and staff, child abuse reporting procedures, disaster preparedness, emergency shelters, discrimination, harassment, intimidation, bullying, hate crimes, and toxic substances. And I just think, you know, I know it's tradition annually. We put this on the consent calendar. We vote and approve. Um, but there's a lot of work that go into these. And I really think um, in light of just events we've uh, seen in the past few months, I think it's important that we as trustees pause for a minute and first thank the great work. Um, not only is it our school site councils, but each of our school site councils, I was told, uh, brings in Rockland Police and Fire Department as well to review um, items with each of them. Um, and so I just wanna do a shout out to those um, first as appreciation. I also do think it's timely and important um, that we uh, look at um, some of the actions we've taken. Uh, I know we have a safety committee. I know I piloted one some time ago specifically about drug use. I know we have an overall safety committee um, by the direction of Superintendent Stock um, that looks at a variety of things with RPD. Um, I know in our October 19th meeting, we got an update. Um, I know that we actually allocated as a board $730,000 at that board meeting. Um, but $25,000 of that was actually a request for a school assessment to be made. Um, and I, I would love to formally request that we have an update on those items. Um, would love to hear where we're at with the expenditure of those items. Um, and then also that um, school assessment. Uh, I really want to make sure we follow up. I know there's some ideas I heard from community members. Um, and they're kind of being vetted by RPD in the safety committee. And I think that's great. That's the important place to do it at and the correct place to do it at. Um, but I'd love to see us get something on the agenda at an upcoming 
um, either meeting or even an update to the board just for us to, to be aware of, one, how those dollars were spent, and then two, the money that was allocated for a school assessment um, to make sure our campuses are as safe as can be for our students. Um, it, I, absolutely, uh, Trustee Sadoff will be happy to uh, provide uh, follow-up information to the safety plan uh, that the board approved uh, earlier this year and, and update the board on you know, where we're at with actions implementing regarding that uh, and, and, and provide uh, an update. And so I'll work uh, with you and, and President Hupp to either look at that as a future agenda item or, or is it through a memorandum uh, to give the board that updated information uh, because we, we agree that um, it is important that we uh, follow up and, can, and have a constant conversation around safety in our community because we know that's the top priority is keeping all of our kids and our staff and, and visitors to our schools safe. Um, so we'll be happy to provide that updated information. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. While we have this item pulled, can you talk just a little bit um, about there's some, there's some variety. There's a little inconsistency among the um, sites. Can you address that? Um, we, we can, and, and one of those is that, of course, every single school is, is unique and different in, 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 in the, just even the physical makeup of it and some of the concerns and patterns they see, say, for example, in their Swiss PBIS data system of how they're looking at w what priorities they have. And so there is some variability in, in, in where, um, how they look at that. There's also a standard uh, ed code requirement for the number and types of drills that are conducted, and we expect all schools to have that. Some schools choose to go a little bit extra, depending on maybe they feel there's a need for an additional type of drill practice, so you may see some variance there. And then we really, um, you know, work with our schools to have a consistent template and then work with them to look at the unique needs. Is, is their school site councils really approve these? Which is a school site council, if you aren't aware, is made up of, of parents, teachers, and at our secondary school students, and they're elected by uh, the, the community in that school. And so we're always looking at those plans to look and see, you know, how do we look at, you know, kind of that continuous improvement lens, how do we tighten those up, how do we make them more uh, useful? And then there is actually, on the plan that we have posted on our, on our website, that's a, a huge part of that plan, but there's a piece of the plan that we actually don't publish. It's even more, we'd be like a binder. And part of that is based on some of the response protocols we use in situations and based on uh, the advice of Rockland PD that we don't publicize those. Um, we don't, but, but you, would, you would see those and then if we were to literally print them out, uh, we would bring you a huge binder. So we're working to improve those and there is variability based on the unique needs of schools. Thank you. So is there a motion to approve 8.16 safety plans? So moved. Second. First by Trustee Sadoff, second by Trustee Price. Georgia, we please call the roll. Callista Zarellis. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Uh, motion passes. Now to item 9.1, action on the grades three through five science adoption, Amplify Science, Dr. Bill McDonald, Associate Superintendent, Elementary Education and Educational Services. Good, uh, good morning, good uh, evening again, Board of Trustees. <laughs> it's been that kind of day. Uh, President Hub, Superintendent Stock, it's a pleasure to bring the K-5 science curriculum adoption recommendation back to you. Um, as I get this queued up, I will say there's been a lot of good news tonight, um, but I think my favorite is the potential reopening of Midas. That has been a thorn in our side. <laughs> I think I speak for the whole community on that one. Um, okay, so tonight I will be bringing back um, what came to you initially at the February 15th board meeting, uh, a recommendation from the K-5 Science Adoption Committee, which began meeting in 2019, a committee of about 25 teachers who went through an extensive process and then made a recommendation for a curriculum, but had that recommendation um, paused because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was resurrected uh, last December with uh, 18 of the original uh, members who unanimously um, re uh, re-adopted or re-recommended um, a curriculum, and that was brought to you on February 15th. 
Tonight, we will look at that recommendation. We'll talk a little bit more. The board had requested more information about Amplify Science specifically, um, but also about how it, would be, how it would look in the classroom, the public review process, and then uh, if adopted, a proposed implementation and training plan. Uh, the recommendation that came from the committee, as I said, was a uni unanimously recommended after rigorous review and piloting over the course of a year. Um, it provides uh, the next generation science standards uh, into our schools, which are aligned uh, content with coupling, uh, engaging in hands-on experiences for students, labs, virtual modeling, field experiences that really build a strong foundation for science, knowledge, and learning. The new uh, science standards have a lot more real-world connections and opportunities for students to practice science rather than just read about it. Um, it also provides teachers with an online learning management system that includes uh, virtual textbooks, demo lessons, and simulations. It prepares students for the California Science Test exam in fifth grade, which is a cumulative test of standards and practices that span grades three through five. And it aligns with uh, our currently adopted six through eight science program, which is also Amplify. So what would Amplify look like in classrooms if it were to be adopted? Um, there are four types of units. So at each grade level, there's four units. Um, they each emphasize a particular science and engineering practice. As I said, this is much more based on real world science and hands-on learning. There's investigation, modeling, design, and argumentation. Each of the four units has 20 lessons, which are approximately one hour long. In a school year, there are about 80 to 90 hours of instruction per grade. Since there are about 180 instructional days in the year, completing all the units and lessons would mean teaching science about two, time, two to three times weekly for an hour. That's a little bit more than what we do now. Typically now we have about two hours of science being taught weekly, so this would increase science time in schools. Um, but the way we're thinking about this is a, a really a slow and deep approach to implementation, which would mean um, maybe implementing two units the first year, really doing a lot of professional development and support for teachers, classroom observations, lesson studies, training, so that they can implement this in, in an effective and deep way and learn as teachers as well. Um, so we would probably be rolling out to the four units over a course of two to three years. Um, in each unit, students embody the role of a different professional scientist or engineer. Hands-on learning, as I mentioned, is an essential part of Amplify Science. In their roles, students would actively participate as they gather evidence, think critically, solve problems, develop and defend claims about the world around them. Every unit includes those hands-on investigations, which are critical to achieving the unit's learning goals. In addition, Amplify offers flex extensions, which is even more hands-on learning should the teacher um, want to implement uh, additional pieces for their classroom. To the public review process, uh, after presenting on February 15th to the board, we, we per California Education Code 6202, a public review of the recommended cu curriculum is required for a minimum of 30 days. Moreover, uh, moreover, Ed Code 60002 states that each district board shall promote the involvement of parents and other members of the community in the selection of instructional materials. So over the past two months, Rockland has made the Amplify Science curriculum available to parents teachers, staff members, and other district constituents who are interested in learning more. To do this, we created a K-5 science website um, to facilitate public access to the curriculum. Hard copies of the entire Amplify Science curriculum were for grades three, four, and five were available for viewing at the district office. Digital access to the curriculum was available to any person who wanted to view the student online experience, including lessons, readings, and science labs and virtual feedback was solicited through a form on the website for all constituents to submit feedback and comments about the curriculum. District office were also available to answer specific questions about the curriculum or adoption process via email and phone call. <clears throat> Finally, um, if the science curriculum were to be adopted, what would implementation look like? Um, curriculum for third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers would be purchased and delivered to school sites before the end of the school year. Um, also, teachers would have online virtual access to the entire curriculum so they could review it. If they chose to look it over over the summer, they could do that, but they would have it in their hands. Professional development for teachers in grades three for five, three for five on understanding the next generation science standards um, actually occurred on April 10th. We did an hour and a half with K-5 teachers on the new standards and the shifts. Again, 
much more focus on that phenomenon we did last time and, and what happened, connecting real world science and then learning about the science in the classroom. Um, and then we would provide more professional development on our PD day on September 18th, 2023. Again, the other part of this is that really deep approach. We do follow up training for teachers, more formal training, lesson observations, coaching throughout next year and the following year to make sure this was very embedded and teachers were comfortable with this really new style of teaching science. And then finally, parent information nights would be scheduled to explore uh, next generation science standards and also the Amplify curriculum. Um, with that, I will um, open it up to the board for questions and discussion. Thank you. Trustees. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Um, I have a couple questions before I get into personal comments, um, but just a couple questions first. Uh, I went back and looked through both the February 15th presentation and then also the presentation tonight. I didn't notice anywhere cost of this curriculum. Do you know the cost of this curriculum to the district, both for implementation and then ongoing annually for consumables? Sure, the curriculum cost for 3-5 was $500,000, and that's for an eight-year contract. And the training cost, um, the training will mostly be done on our professional development days, so that's included in the curriculum um, cost. Um, there will be some, because I want to, I would really want to do that deep training, there'll be some sub-release required. So I would offhand probably budget about twenty to $30,000 over two years to do that deeper professional development for teachers. In addition to the 500000 yeah, that's the curriculum cost for, mm -hmm. for the hard copies and the virtual access over eight mm -hmm. years. What about also consumables? I know um, when yeah. this was presented to us February 15th, the, the hands-on component was talked about quite often. Uh, looking at the curriculum, it looks like it's heavily dependent upon that. Do you know what the approximate cost annually would be for three through five? They're actually included in the first three years, so we get three years of consumables. And the question is, and this is the publisher's very open about this, and sixth grade is too, where we adopted Amplify a year and a half ago, is some teachers really like the consumables and some don't because the entire curriculum is actually virtual. So everything you can get in a consumable textbook, the kids can complete and submit online to the teacher. So some teachers are very comfortable using that online format for student submission. Some teachers actually really like the hard copy books, and we're gonna give them a choice in those first three years. And if they don't use them, the good news is we can warehouse them and give them to the teachers that want them, so they may actually last four or five years. But if we found that teachers wanted more of the hard copies after year three, then yes, that would be an additional purchase. You're meaning the student workbook hard copies. I'm thinking the example you showed us at the February 15th, it was like a candle and it was lit. Uh -huh. Are we assuming then that would not be physical hands-on in the classroom? That would be a video they watch? No, that's all part of the curriculum that comes in like a science box. So if you were going to do like, there's the... There's the teacher edition, there's the student books, there, it's, and then there's, it's all virtual, but you also get like a box, which would be, if you're gonna do a lab today that involves the candle experiment, you open the box and everything's in there, teacher materials, student materials, so you can lay that out in a classroom and have it ready. So that's included in the price of the curriculum. So the $500,000 for the eight-year contract also includes three years of consumables, but the remaining five years we would need to budget for. The consumables are actually projected to last a, a class of 32 years. Um, the good news on that is we could plan ahead much. They'll replace it for us, and there is a cost associated with that. It's not a large cost. But much of the things we replace are like paper clips and... Um, you know, candles and things we can buy, plastic bags, things we can buy at the store and replace much cheaper by organizing our own staff to do okay. that Okay, and would you, sorry, it's a really no, important thing. Um, would you ever anticipate that that cost is gonna be sent on to the parent, meaning that students would need to supply those? Because I see lots of hands-on materials. We would plan to provide all of that completely. Yeah, no, we, we always provide all curriculum for students in public schools, so parents would not be asked to provide that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Um, I had a question. So I saw that um, this new curriculum, because it's already been piloted in some classrooms, and it has resulted in an increase in science time teaching, which um, sounds wonderful, and the hands-on is um, excellent. So I'm just wondering, for the teachers who have already implemented this, um, how, how have they made that adjustment and you know, in talking to some uh, some teachers, 
just the logistics of this new structure to teaching science. There's now the bins and the materials that they have to find room for and the setup and breakdown for, for the hands-on experiments. Um, how are they doing that? And is this something where they would maybe want um, help from, say, parent volunteer or science docents or um, things of that nature? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because this curriculum will demand much more from teachers in terms of setting up experiments. I taught a boxed science curriculum that's, that was the predecessor of this, FOSS, and I, it was before I had my own kids, so thank goodness, because I was setting up in the morning and taking down in the evening, it was a lot. Um, the, the teachers who are piloting right now are, um, they're like our true believers, and so they were part of the adoption team, and they love science, and they will gladly teach science all day and set up and take down. Um, you know, much the same way I felt about it. They're willing, you know, when you're passionate, you're willing to go above and beyond. But I think the idea of as we do this professional development, really considering teacher time, which is very uh, scant, is the word I'll choose to use, um, and, and um, how do we support that? I, li I love the idea, many schools and districts I've worked in have had a science docent program where parents will volunteer to support and set up science for teachers. It's a good way for parents to get involved, and it's a huge benefit to walk into um, a, la a science lab or a classroom and have everything set up so you can focus on the teaching and, and then not have to worry also about the cleanup and putting stuff back in the kit. So I, I, I love that idea. I think there are ways we can do that with parents or with staff or support staff to make that happen. So I guess it just, and following up with that, I, I know, again, back in the day, I think Sunset Ranch had, do we have that science lab classroom in all of our 12 elementary schools or is it a little bit of a shuffle or is the expectation, hey, in Miss Hupp's class, you gotta slide, you know, you gotta create it while they're at, I'm just guessing while they're at recess or lunch so they come back and do it. I'm just trying to figure out the logistics in the process. I do believe we have a science or STEM lab of every school. I could be wrong by one or two schools, but I, I don't think so. So I think there actually is a designated space for science at every school. Um, but it's the setup part that's tricky. But yeah, we do have room. And, and that's one of the good things about opening our new school is we've created space at many places for things like science labs. I'm happy to see that there's a multi-layered training for this this new curriculum because um, that was another thing that sounded like was necessary since yeah. not all of our elementary teachers are science-based, right? Um, so I hear the you know the sub-release time, which is to be expected. As far as the coaching and the observations and training, who will be facilitating those? Will that be district staff? Yeah, our Ed Services team would do that. I, one of the models I really liked that we did several years ago and teachers really endorsed was this idea of a, a, a low stakes kind of, it's really observing each other teaching and learning together. And I would like, in this case, I think this is a perfect um, piece that's relatively new to many teachers where they can actually um, go in and observe a science lesson and they can talk about it and then the next iteration gets better and the next iteration gets better and they learn from each other. It's not a cheap model, but it's very effective in terms of fostering that professional learning. The other thing I mentioned, I think last time that I really like about the online piece of this curriculum is for every single lesson in the curriculum, there is a video of an expert teacher teaching that lesson. So if you're like, Excellent. I have no idea how to teach science, you can actually go in and you can watch an expert teacher teach a lesson, and you can, oh, okay, so it's that, or you, you make that teacher move. So I think that's something I've never seen before that I appreciate. Thank you. Um, I know we uh, questioned this at the February 15th meeting, and we got an internal memo, um, but just for those listening today, the committee uh, that recommended this curriculum um, as a unanimous selection, uh, what was that committee composed of? Was that teachers, parents? It was, it was teachers. It okay. was actually Do you remember how many? I don't have it Okay. And it was a K-5 committee of teachers. It also had uh, administrators on it and district office staff, like our coaching staff and our science staff was supporting that. Okay, so teachers, staff, but no parents. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And that actually, on, sorry, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, real quick, and then on the, I guess we're looking at, again, logistics, so that the two to three, I guess I'm saying two is a week, is it one of those things, and again, don't hold me or you know, I don't need you to, to lock it in, but I would assume like in third grade, is it a Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, is it, and then they just kind of cycle through? 
There's two ways to do it, they, and this is what we, we do currently in elementary is with social studies and science. I mean, you're always teaching ELA, you're always teaching math, your PE is required and built in, but with social studies and science, um, you're, you're, you're either alternating, like I'm gonna do that on Wednesday and Thursday afternoon, I'm gonna do science on Friday and Monday afternoon. But um, with science and social studies, the other way to do it is you teach science dedicated, like you teach a unit for a month and you don't teach social studies, and then you teach dedicated social studies unit for a month, which is kind of more continuous and you can go a little bit deeper. I think I would recommend that second piece for science, but that will be up to teachers. Um, I just think it's more immersive. Follow-up question to uh, Trustee Sadoff. It says in Ed Code 60002, each district board shall promote the involvement of parents and other members of the community in the selection of instructional materials. And I'm wondering if that happened. Um, you know, traditionally, honestly, we the parents haven't been part of our selection committees. I mean, that's just, I'm just speaking. I know that we're in a different era now, but that hasn't been a situation where um, parent, it's, it's a very technical process. So, I've used this example with a couple of you, but um, there's a lot, that the first part of this is like, I mentioned like eight days of professional development around a rubric to select a curriculum, and because you're looking at 12 different curriculums, and many of the pieces of that evaluation process are like a teacher lens, like how would this work for EL students? How would this work for special education students? How's the learning management system? Um, is it engaging for students? So many pieces as a parent you would unless you have an educational background, you might struggle with how do you evaluate a curriculum if you haven't been in that chair, which is mm -hmm. why Ed Code talks to teachers being the majority representation on those committees, sure. right? That's not to say there aren't parents who are qualified to do that work and give input, mm -hmm. but it, and again, it's a year long process, so big commitment, um, probably just in selecting a curriculum to pilot, we're talking 30 hours and then we're going into piloting in classrooms. And so once you get to that point, how does that role work? So, so it's not something that's insurmountable, but something we haven't done and, and we need to figure out. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. McDonald? Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Okay. One Sorry, more. I do have one more. I know we got an more. internal memo. Um, when it comes to the adoption of science curriculum, um, do you know, are there other districts that have already adopted Amplify, Amplify curriculum? There is, and I would have to pull up my, my list, but there's, of the, I think, five or six lo local districts, uh, two or three had already adopted, and I think two are currently in process of adopting, and mm. two are adopting in the next year. Is not specifically Amplify, though. They're oh, looking no, at a variety of curriculum, just yeah. to clarify. Because yeah, I actually, I did ask around, and a lot of districts um, yeah. have either chosen not to use Amplify, or they're doing a full selection with parents of six different curriculums. So I was just wondering if we looked at that data as well. I'm sorry, repeat that again? Sorry. Of the, the options available for the curriculum, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure the options are limitless. Do you know how many? The state adopted list has, like, I don't know, 12 or 14, okay. so we looked at all of those. So those are all at William Jessup, and we went as a, a team, that committee I talked about went to William Jessup, we checked out all the curriculum, we used that rubric to evaluate all 12 of those. Before we piloted, the committee chose to pilot um, just those two, which were Discovery and Amplify after that evaluation process. Okay. Which is typical that a school district would pilot Two to three, I mean, piloting is six to eight weeks, and it's, and it's, you're teaching to kids, so it's extensive. So typically, you would narrow that field down to those two to three. Okay, and when you pilot, I know parents are notified that a curriculum's being piloted. Are they actually solicited, though, for like a pre and post survey? Um, we don't do a pre to post survey with parents. We notify them. Um, we, um, yeah, but we, ha we haven't asked them about their students. Ex We'd mm -hmm. ask students about their experience with the curriculum and mm -hmm. teachers, but we haven't surveyed parents about okay. that interaction, no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just asking the same, do we know other local districts that use Amplify 3 to 5? Um, there's, I, I think, I believe that, again, I have to look at my list, but Elk Grove, um, Sacramento City, I think both have Amplify. Um, that are right off the top of my head. They've been adopted for several years. There's another 
Maybe for, uh, Folsom Cordova also might be another one that has adopted Amplify. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit? This is something that came up in um, the teacher survey that um, Travis had mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, the current science curriculum that's being used in grades three through five um, and how the teachers are um, supplementing that or what materials they're using. Um, based on the survey, what we, we already knew, so we adopted our current science curriculum in 2008. It's McGrillen, Mac, Macmillan McGraw, um, and teacher input on that, um, I think they said that 8% of them said they were using that curriculum. The rest were using something else. We've, we've, we've kind of promoted mystery science, mm -hmm. um, which is an online NGSS aligned curriculum as a supplemental option mm -hmm. for several years because it's easy to use, it's aligned with the current standards, teachers want to use it. So in that survey, teachers indicated they're using mystery science among other things. Um, but many were not using the current adoption. Is mystery science free to us? No, we, we pay, it's about $15,000 a year. 15 or 50? 15 okay. for, for all grades, mm -hmm. all districts. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, trustees, this is our opportunity to discuss what we think about this adoption. I think we first, following board comments, go to public comment. Public comment. Oh, okay. That's not the way to place it. Okay. All right, so we will do, we will do public comments first. I would rather do public Um. Yeah, trustees, you you can uh, if you have discussions and, and things, and then and then the real and intent. And I apologize for for my for my uh, signal confusion and signaling to you is just that the uh, any public comment mm -hmm. prior to taking action, but but more discussion mm -hmm. is appropriate. Right, at the time. right, yes. I I so I think COVID taught us a lot, and in the last five years. Things have been very different um, in our communities and in our schools and with our relationships between our communities and our schools. And I don't think there's an emergency. I think that oftentimes things are presented to us and we have one month to think about it and we have to make a decision, make a decision, make a decision. And I don't think that um, there is the urgency um, that it seems to be. I am very focused on Ed Code 60002, which states each district board shall promote the involvement of parents and other members of the community in the selection process of instructional materials. And I don't feel like that happened here, not purposefully. Um, I just think that Things have always been done a certain way, and so we continue to do them that way. Um, but I think that we need to just take a breath and think about the way we do things. I think more than anything right now to promote um, community relationships and um, support in our schools, we must have parent involvement. If we are asking the parents to support what we do, then we need to invite them into the process. And I don't think what we have always done does that. Um, I, as a board member, have felt um, a little out of the loop in the adoption process. As a teacher, I understand how it works. We we get the materials, we get, these are the two you get to look at. Go ahead and try them out in your classroom and tell us which of the two you like best. Um, I don't, as a board member, all of that is done for, in this case, since 2019, which is a lot, um, but a lot has happened since then. And, and we aren't involved in that part of it at all. And then we have an information item and we're told, now you need to vote. And I'm not comfortable 
with this vote tonight. Um, I feel like it was, it was done the way it's always been done, and I don't have anything bad to say about that. Uh, and change is hard. I know change is hard for all of us, but I think change is necessary. Our community has changed. Our world has changed. Our laws have changed. And I think we need to think about how we can change to meet the new needs of our community. I would like to table this item and rethink our process. I'm not saying that Amplify might be awesome and it might be where we land, but I want parents to have a say in that. Um, and I want parents to see what's out there, to be honest. I think if parents were involved in the process, there would be nothing but respect. There would be nothing but support. I think if parents could see what goes on behind the scenes in this process, they would be cheering for our teachers. But I think they need to see it. They need to hear the conversations. They need to know what's being focused on. They need to know what's important because I think they would be very happy to see the parents talk, I mean the teachers talking about the wonderful things in the science and the experiments and the schedule. I, I just think, um, and I don't know if anybody else agrees with me, but I just think um, as a board, we have said all along that our goal is parent and community involvement in everything we do and transparency in everything we do. And I think because this process was started in 2019 before most of us were on the board, um, it went forward without those goals being met. And I think um, there is no emergency and I'm willing to take a pause and back up and make sure that our goals are being met. I think, uh, it I agree. I'm, I'm with you. I, I think it creates the opportunity again from a from a continuous improvement standpoint from the Plan Do Check Act. I think we we've been using Mystery Science Theater, 15 grand a year, and and, and I'm sure it was Mystery Science, not theater. Mystery Science. Sorry, we've been using that all the way you know 15 grand a year, which is great. I would be very curious to see, and I think just from a metric standpoint, how did our fifth graders score in 21 and 22? Maybe if we got scores from 20 grade, I'm assuming. COVID kind of ruined that for us. But just to see where we're at from a baseline standpoint so that we know where we need to improve on, right? You always want to get to 100%. You always want to get to the top. But I think it would allow us the time to put a baseline in and say, okay, here's, here's what we were getting for 15000 a year. Here's, here's the way it was working. Are we meeting the NGSS standards? I'm hoping so. And if we're not, here's the gaps we got to close. And then whatever curriculum we choose, we know that that's where we need to target on. That's what we look at. So just from a, from a process improvement, from a continuous improvement standpoint, I think it would it gives us that. And, and if we have that already right now, I'd, I'd love to see it, love to, love to just look at it and, and, and know the gaps. Again, just like we did with math, like we did with ELA, here's where we're at. Let's create a program to make it better. And, and we've done some great work with that. I'd just love to see that with, with the science. Use the science in science, right? So. So what I'm wondering then with this line of discussion, because I would argue that there is a sense of urgency in that as I look through the teacher responses that we got from the survey, I don't really know what's worse, teachers having to teach a curriculum from 2008 or teachers having to cobble together materials to teach their class and having a third grader myself and one that will be going through these grades. I just want to know what that looks like. I think, given that we had this material available to the public for double the amount of time that you know was originally set out, we got very few responses, all in favor and supporting the teachers and the district efforts to get this in, in place. I think that that reflects a trust in the community of our teachers that are teaching our kids every day. And I look at the list of people who were involved in this, and they are respected, tenured teachers. I think it's great to continue to talk about building parent involvement, but the idea 
of tabling this, and I don't even know what it would you know, look like at this point or how that would delay getting new curriculum into our classrooms for next school year, but it does concern me because I think this is the process we have with faults, whatever those may be, but this is important, and I think that I don't know what tabling means. I guess I, want to, I would want to know more about that. You know, I hear the sense of responsibility of, you know, school board members were elected to make decisions, right? And, um, and sometimes that means we need more information before we make a decision, or sometimes it's we make a decision with the limited information we have. Um, I feel like I have quite a bit of information, if I'm honest. Um, I understand if I ever have a colleague, though, that feels they need more, I'm, I'm open, and I'm, I'm thinking through that at the moment out loud. <laughs> um, I, I will say uh, that I think we have a few issues here. I think there's a process. Uh, as we see, there will be continual need to assess curriculum and adopt new curriculum. And what process is this board comfortable with that would make sure kind of those stones um, are flipped over and turned? And, and I, I do have legitimate concerns about this process, and I want to talk about that later, but I want to be able to hear from our public. It looks like there's many people in the room. I don't know how many cards we have. I want to be able to hear their comments. Um, so I do think my, my larger concerns um, are the process. So I'm with you on that, Trustee Hub. Of I do think that our process needs to change. I think how we adopt curriculum, who we include in those conversations, and when we include them in those conversations. I actually had Ed Code 60002 on my paper too. You must have been reading my notes. Um, you know, and I think sometimes we can get caught up in semantics, but I will tell you, I have seen uh, grown men and women argue over the words may or will in this very room for hours. I've seen it at the state level. There's a reason why. What we put in writing and what the state puts in writing is very, very clear. And when it's not clear, it's up to school boards and local electeds to make the decision. And so I do think 6002 is very clear to me when it says curriculum selection. It doesn't say final review after a selection has been proposed. It doesn't say um, the option to remove your child if you don't like the selection made. It says a part of the selection process. And so I think the more we can accomplish that and do that, that's only a success for our entire community. Like I said at the February 15th meeting, we missed an opportunity to celebrate together as a community. If this is a great curriculum that's needed and loved and celebrated, then let's talk about it. Let's talk about why it's needed. Let's talk about its cost. Let's talk about, um, you know, the, the survey I think was a step. I actually appreciate um, the comment about the survey. When I saw the survey results, I went, I don't know what the answers mean. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know when I see that only 8% are using the current curriculum, but many of them are using mystery science, does that mean they like using mystery science and that that's a solution that's working? I, I didn't know how to really understand the data that was extrapolated from that. So I, I do think um, it's important we hear from our community. I've heard a lot from our community on this issue. I feel like I've actually heard quite a bit. Um, and so I am ready uh, to make a decision when it comes to Amplify uh, tonight. Um, but I also um, am open to the conversation of uh, part of that, I think, is because the process, I do think, missed a few points. Um, and again, I don't think that's on any one person. Uh, I think we said that in the February 15th meeting um, that we felt caught off guard about this. Um, I know a lot of the work was before almost all of us were elected, <laughs> uh, right? And that happens when you have board changes, then sometimes you have new processes that need to be adopted. So I do have some new processes I'd like to look at. I do have some um, new ideas. Um, I, I do want to make sure, though, um, whether we are ready to make a decision tonight or table, that we do allow those that have taken the time to leave their families tonight to come and make a comment. I do want to hear what they have to say about Amplify. I'll just add, um, I, I mentioned also during the February meeting that my, my concern is that I think Ed Code um, 60002 is clear. And I also think that we as um, trustees have been very clear that we really care about access and transparency for our families. I don't know how we can be more clear about it. Will we be able to hear any information tonight or will we have to wait until later? I am concerned with the status of how it is and I don't, 
I don't understand whether or not implementing a new science curriculum by next school year will be possible given what the sentiment of the board is at this time. But I'm concerned that continuing to operate as is opens us up to a potential Williams Act issue given the feedback and what's being utilized in classes now. And I think that's a major concern. So I don't share that concern simply because um, I teach science with mystery science and it's a blast and my kids love it. And um, I'm not saying that I am proposing that teachers continue using mystery science, but I do think it's perfectly fine stopgap while we figure out um, where to go next. That's my opinion, so um, take it or leave it. But uh, we have a blast with mystery science and it does cover the standards. So I'm not concerned that our kids are not getting science. They're getting science and it's fun science and frankly, it's very easy to teach. It comes with a lot of um, videos and um, very simple supplies. So I'm not concerned about that. I agree with um, Trustee Counter that it would be uh, interesting to see how the scores fall out for that. Um, but I know uh, where I teach, a lot of teachers are using mystery science, maybe even all of them, and our scores are great. So I'm not overly concerned about that, which is one of the reasons why I am suggesting a pause and suggesting that it is not urgent. Um, I think what is urgent is our relationship with our community. And I feel that very strongly. I have felt that for several year, years now. I feel like to, I, I can't say this strongly enough. We have fabulous teachers. And I truly believe that every time parents and teachers work together, it is successful. It is wonderful. It builds confidence, it builds trust, and it builds support. And I, I think when we skip that step, we lose that trust. And I'm not willing to lose that trust. And, and it was really hard through COVID. There was a lot that went on and a lot of trust lost in our community. And I think our time now is for rebuilding that. And it's so deserved. And I think it's a lot of misinformation that causes the lack of trust. Anyone who works in a classroom comes away knowing how awesome our teachers are. Anyone who works with one of our teachers supports our teachers. And I think it's a mistake to not give parents that opportunity. I, I don't think it, we need to urgently rush forward and skip a very important step. I just wonder, you know, if, and I, I, I do not disagree with in, incorporating parents into the process and continuing to do better, but given the timeline for doing something like this, and obviously there was a pretty significant pause, um, it's just seeing the parent feedback that came through and just wondering with the, all the time given, granted, they're looking at Amplify, but so many chose not to actively engage in the process. And again, because I've had many numerous conversations, the take home point was the teachers recommend it, we trust the teachers, and I just, I am, I, I have concerns, and I also have concerns about mystery science in the upper um, elementary grades, because I have heard concerns from those who are familiar with the material, which I am not. Okay, so just real quick, we use, and help me out, but we use Amplify 6, 7, and 8, and then what do we use in 9 through 12? Amplify also? We use some older curriculum, but I'll be informing you um, in the next presentation about moving forward with 9 through 12 science. Uh, if I could, actually, Trustee Sutherland, I just wanted to address um, something that you said, and I, I kind of addressed it earlier, but um, I don't think I made the connection. As a, as a board member, being introduced to one curriculum after the process is done is a little bit 
it's difficult because there's nothing to compare it to. And it feels like it, it's already done. So what's the point? And I, the fact that we only had, it was like 20 or 21 parent responses after a month and a half of um, being able to review it, I think on the one hand that says parents trust teachers, but I think on the other hand it says what's the point? Why bother? It's already done. And I, that's why I think when we say we're involving parents, if that involvement just means come and see what we've already done, I don't actually think that's involvement. And I don't think it encourages parents to feel like they actually had a part in it. Because I know as a board member, I, I don't feel like I had a part in it. And if as a board member, I don't feel that way, I'm positive that there are many parents who, who feel like, what's the point? I, I'm, it's already done, so what does my comment have to do with anything except either to complain or to just say, yay. I, I don't feel like that's actually involvement. You know, and I had a couple of prepared comments actually on that. Um, I was going to wait till after, but I'll, I'll mention them since we're talking about them. Um, you know, we have over 11,000 students, uh, many, of which have, many of which have multiple guardians. We got 21 written comments. Three of which didn't have students in our district. Yeah, and, and so I think that the outreach responsibility is on us. Uh, to me, that doesn't show that, um, um, and I hear you, Michelle, Trustee Sutherland, when you say, um, you know, maybe they just weren't interested or engaged or concerned. And, and I hear that, but I do think I have to take into consideration there were only 21 comments out of 11,000 um, plus students. Uh, and in addition to that, those 21 comments, they were written as early as February 16th. We as trustees didn't get access until this Monday, 417 at 346 p.m. Many of us have full-time jobs during the day. Mm -hmm. I literally was up until 1 a.m. the other night trying to read through everything. Um, if we really, really want to show we value that feedback, I didn't have an opportunity to call those 21 people and talk to them. I didn't have an opportunity to follow up with those individuals. And so if we're asking parents to give us feedback, we have to be able to, A, as trustees, know that feedback's being given and it be given to us sooner. And then B, um, make sure that we actually understand what that feedback is and that it's representative of our 11,000 students of the population. And then also in addition to that, um, and I know it was kind of mentioned, but something I wanted to mention too, um, you know, there was, a, there was a memo given to the board with options that the board had. It would never said on that memo that not adopting Amplified was an option. That not adopting Amplify um, could be an option that's fully legal. And so, uh, you know, if we as board members didn't know that that was an option and had to question it, um, I wonder how parents felt out in the community as well. And so again, I think my earlier comments reiterate really where I'm at with those points is, I don't want parents involved after the fact where they have 30 days. And I know we gave more than 30 days. I, I understand that. Um, but a lot of times, I mean, parents were notified via an email, which I'm appreciative of, and one newsletter. I'm appreciative of that. But the response of only 21 outside of, now I had people contact me personally. Every single person that contacted me personally was not one of those 21. I don't know why they didn't comment on that but I do know they shared very real concerns with me directly. So that's a concern to me that we base our decision off of 21 comments that were written in, many of which were back in February. I, I don't think that we're drawing a conclusion from those, but I think that the level of response, and yeah, I'm, I would imagine that we all have had private conversations with the different members of the community, but again, you know, I think in looking at the room and what we have heard, and I agree, but I am very concerned about this idea of just using this mystery science for, what, the next year, two years? I'm concerned by that with a third grader right now. I just wanted to make one more comment. I, too, am frustrated with the process. I asked for... Um, to read the feedback from the families February 27th, March 13th, and again the morning of the 17th when we finally got them that afternoon. 
And also one of the options that we were given um, suggested that we not utilize our sensitive topics policy and communication to families. And we've been really clear that that's something that we really care about and um, prioritize. So there's been several frustrations um, along the way. What was the about the sensitive topics? That we not utilize the sensitive topics policy. Oh, I, I am actually happy that we have the sensitive topics policy in place. Yes. I actually, and I think Trustee Counter was, is the only one here on the board that was part of that, but um, I think that the sensitive topics policy helps to give parents information that they need to be the parent that they need to be to their kids, and it allows for respect across our whole community. I think... Um, you know, if that's something that's being discussed, but um, that's something that I actually, in going over this, felt like, regardless, we would want to have. I think all of us do. Yeah. Um, and, and I also, you know, had asked, and I think, you know, there's time collecting all of this, but I had been, you know, looking for these parent responses as well, and, um, you know, I guess, silver lining that there weren't a ton of them, getting them with the timeline, but, um, I felt like at least I don't. I'm not going to read through them, but um, you know they were concise and clear. Okay. Oh, thank you. All right, so when you come up, please state your full name, city you live in, and school your children attend. All comments must be addressed to the board directly. The first, there's not 10 people, so you'll have three minutes, um, and your time cannot be yielded to anyone else. The board is not permitted to deliberate or take action. Well, it's not a non-agenda item. So comments must be respectful and professional, no profanity. So I will say who is up first and who's on deck. Um, first, we will hear from Wendy Beal. Hello, President Hupp and Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. Um, I appreciate the time this evening. I just want to say this is the first time I've been here since we have our new board, so congratulations on your presidency. But um, a couple of things, I just wanna thank this board for just everything that you do, your transparency, your wanting to include parents. I appreciate you all so much, I can't tell you. Um, as you know, I work for an organization that um, we, we help all school districts in Placer County. This board is amazing. Um, I appreciate you following Ed Code 60002. Um, I do want to say that I am concerned about this curriculum. The committee of all teachers, I can tell you if there were parents involved in looking at this curriculum, this would not have been 100% um, approved or pushed forward. Um, I believe the what I've seen is inappropriate. Um, it's for third to fifth graders. It's borderlining critical race theory. It is teaching things that our kids don't need to be taught. This is science. Let's stick to science for, for these children. Um, I homeschooled five of my kids, so I know about much about curriculum. Um, I don't have a degree in being a teacher, but I do know a lot about curriculum and looking through, so I know what's out there. I see a $47,500 difference a year for the curriculum that we're using now versus the curriculum um, that um, we're looking at possibly um, approving tonight. The sensitive topic policy, I believe that there are lots of sensitive topics in this curriculum. Um, so you're gonna be reaching out to a lot of parents a lot of the time if you push this curriculum. And I respect you, President Hupp, so much for um, asking to take a pause, but I am asking for this board to vote no on this curriculum tonight. Um, as 
Mr. McDonald had said, there's 12 to 14 other curriculums. Allow the parents to be involved in this process. Let us help you. Let us encourage those teachers. Let us build the relationships with the teachers. Um, there are so many parents in this community that love and want to be involved in their children's education. And I just appreciate this board and I appreciate the fact that you all are willing to allow us to do that. Thank you. Thank you, and I did forget to say who was on deck. We will now hear from Matthew Oliver, and on deck would be Mike Murray. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity. Matthew Oliver, live in Rockland. I, as well, so appreciate this board. I've uh, been able to attend quite a few board meetings where parents are not allowed to be involved in the process, where we're actually kept out of the process completely. And your willingness to allow parents to be involved, your willingness to risk on parents, that is huge. And I am just so grateful for that. I also love me some mystery science theater. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, I've had three children go through uh, Rockland uh, Elementary Schools, and I have a four-year-old gearing up, getting ready to go through, and uh, they went through the current science curriculum, and uh, it's amazing. They're awesome. And um, at 500,000 spent on curriculum, I think some of that could be invested elsewhere, like perhaps supplies, Ms. Sutherland, for your children's teachers so that they have those resources that they need. Um, but Mr. McDonald, to so easily dismiss parents is absolutely wrong. Parents should have been allowed to be involved in the parenting part. I own four successful businesses and have raised, and currently raising, five kids, and was just instantly disqualified. Parents should be allowed to be in the parent part. Uh, instead, we have not been allowed to be in any part of looking at this curriculum. Hopefully the next curriculum that's being presented, we also get to be a part of. Um, but this curriculum appears to be an attempt to sneak in an ulterior motive. Fo focusing on sex, identity, and race, it raises a red flag. This curriculum is divisive, sowing seeds of racism and segregation, dividing our children by their skin color, race, gender, and gender identity. My oldest son is adopted. He's uh, not like my other kids. But we have worked very hard to have him included in our family and to be just a part and not to be separated and segregated and set aside. It actually was other people trying to teach my children racism and them trying to tell him how much he's different that my kids never knew, they never saw. And in this curriculum, I see them working very hard at trying to create uh, this difference in segregation. One part of it, of this curriculum says this, he wanted to find out how many scientists working across the country identified themselves as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, and straight. He wanted to know what scientists thought about attitudes towards the LGBTQ community. Why is this in our science curriculum? This isn't about science. This is about trying to find what separates people when we need to be looking to find what brings us together. I stand as well and hope that you don't just pause Thank you. Up next is Mike Murray, and on deck is Courtney Weidman. Uh, Mike Murray, I got kids at Cobblestone, live in Rockland, and I apologize, I came straight from the softball fields over here. Uh, I rushed here because I have big concerns with the proposed curriculum. Uh, from what I've seen, there's content that is not age appropriate, that dabbles into current hot button political issues. As a parent of kids this age, a fourth grader and a first grader, they love science. The last thing I want is, and the last thing they want, is for their science class to be hijacked by social justice. They love the current curriculum, and they come home excited about it. I don't share the fears of using this curriculum. Um, as a parent, I encourage it. I encourage waiting until we find the best curriculum for our kids. Um, new doesn't always mean better. Please keep the focus on education. Let these kids worry about the weight of the world and the politics when it's age appropriate. 
this specific curriculum it is unnecessary and heavy in the politics and not appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. And up next is Courtney Weidman. And I don't have any other green cards on this topic. Good evening, board. I wasn't expecting to speak, so bear with me here. Um, just some observations I have. We heard uh, Travis talking for about 10 minutes or so on true collaboration amongst teachers and the district. How are we not collaborating with parents? This is crazy. Um, I'm considered competent enough to sit on a site council for my children's school, but not competent enough to review science elementary curriculum for elementary kids. I, I, I'm I baffled by that. Um, quick survey I did of parents I know that have children in the Rockland School District in elementary. None of them knew about this, not one of them. So it's not that they're um, disengaged. I think maybe they're you know, uneducated on the information at hand, but I, I, I don't think that Rockland parents are disengaged. And I think that we need to give them an opportunity to know more about what's going on. And if there's only 20 cards, then something needs to change on your guys' end. You gotta do a better job of getting the information out. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have more discussion before we go to a vote? I have a couple items that I just want to make sure that are not necessarily part of the vote, um, but I do want to make sure that they're on record because I do think it's important. Um, I, I think it's incredibly important that we reevaluate um, a few different things. Uh, one, I'd like to make a request that I would like to see parents on committees, all committees. So if that's a curriculum committee, um, I know we've said that at previous board meetings. I know we've um, given that direction. Um, I understand if that means that we need to bring a board policy forward in order to ensure that happens. Um, I'm more than willing to do that legwork to make that happen. Um, so in specific, I'm making a formal request that parents be on all committees, including curriculum preview committees. Um, I'm open to hearing how the district feels that could look, what that would look like, number, um, open to those conversations. Um, but I'd like to see us have that conversation at a future time. Um, I also want to see us have a conversation about better outreach. Um, I am so appreciative of the email that was sent out, the link. I, I really do appreciate the online source as well. I know a lot of districts don't have that bill, or <laughs> Dr. McDonald. Um, I do want to make sure that you hear that from me. I know that you took the time to put this information um, on. I know you took the time to make sure that the links worked. Um, I had many families that did use the link. Um, and so I appreciate you are the transparency of this district to say we want parents to see everything. Um, I want the responsibility to be on us, though, uh, that we make sure um, not only that we're making the material available, that we're actively getting parents engaged. So uh, a couple ideas I have on that is when we pilot something in a classroom, a pre and a post survey um, with a parent. Not only a, hey, we wanna give you a heads up that this material is gonna be piloted in your classroom, but we want your feedback. We want um, your thoughts in the beginning as to why, how your student feels about XYZ science, whatever it is we're piloting. And then a post, um, how do you feel as a parent? The, um, I don't know if when they piloted at that time, if the parents, the, their students were in the classroom being piloted, if they got full access to all the curriculum at that point. If they didn't, I would want them to have full access to the curriculum being piloted in their child's classroom as well, so they can look at everything. Um, but I would like it to be um, outreach that we've done in other areas, whether it's a, a letter given from the teacher in the classroom, whether it's um, a reminder at back to school conferences and that we have to think ahead of time to make sure, but I do think an email out school-wide isn't enough and I'd like to see us do more. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, whenever 
We are looking at future curriculum adoptions. Um, I would like to know a cost breakdown, um, not only of the curriculum, um, but consumables, uh, what that will mean for the district, and I would like all options given to the board that are fully legal, um, whether that means adopting, not adopting, and uh, deadlines. Um, again, I've said it before, there are very clear requirements from the state. It is the responsibility of this district and this board to know the difference between requirements and recommendations, and Amplify is a recommendation, not a requirement. So with that, I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to motion at this time, I think I've heard enough from the community that Amplify is not an option that I feel um, is a fit for our community. I would like to make a motion um, that we um, vote tonight to not adopt Amplify as a curriculum for grades three through five uh, with the open, um, I will be open to a new process of looking at the other remaining 12 to 14 curriculums, including parents. So just, I guess, real quick, so we're saying, and with you, so no on Amplify, but then bring 12, 14, whatever's left over, bring that back to a, to a process, um, work through parents, teachers, folks, put it all together, and then bring it back up, ballpark estimate. We see this probably happening in the fall, bring it back up in the fall, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, summer break and all that stuff. I'm just trying to think, just process-wise, where we're. Uh, um, if the board were to um, not adopt a curriculum this evening, and and then we would, um, in essence, go back to square one of of the process and engage in that, and then obviously, clearly, uh, from the uh, you know, direction from the board, include parents in that process. Um, and, and so we would, in essence, go back to square one, if you will, um, with including parents, including a committee, lo look at the curriculums. And, and the estimate of that process would be if we started in the fall, you know, say September, to get school open, that we would potentially uh, bring um, an information item. We would, of course, uh, we've, I've heard from the board a request for uh, regular uh, detailed updates prior, during, and throughout process, and that would be provided but that we would bring uh, formally an information item um, back potentially uh, around a similar time, and around February, and then we would um, have formal public comment open. Of course, there a lot of opportunity throughout the way, and then potentially bring back an action item at a similar time for really implementation, uh, most likely at the beginning of the following school year, so at the beginning of the 24-25 school year. I I, can I add one that? thought process on his timeline just real quick? My thought process on that, because I thought through that that means it would be a probably a year-long process. Um, the reality is we're at the end of April right now. Um, if we table it tonight, um, we are then going to be asking our teachers to work during the summer, which we made a very concerted effort to not do that. And so I think if we were to table it, um, really then a decision wouldn't really be able to be implemented unless we did mid-semester, mid-year, which I don't think is wise. We learned that very during COVID. So the reality is if we do not vote a full yes tonight on Amplify, it probably will not be implemented for a year either way. Uh, correct. That, that, I absolutely agree with that assessment because we would, uh, one, want to make sure that we um, provide an opportunity for folks to be aware of uh, what the commitment is, to be able to adjust schedules so they could be a part of a process, and that we give enough time for people to be a part of a process. Because the, wor the worst thing we could do is invite people in, say it's an extensive process. By the way, it starts on Tuesday. Um, versus be able to outline a, a calendar of, of, of times and so people can make adjustments to be fully invested and in, involved in the process. So uh, one thing that is, seems to be very clear is that the interest of to have a very thorough and extensive process, not a rush process. So that's why we would want to use um, that, that entire time frame to do so and, and agree with you, Trustee Sadoff, that a mid-year implementation, while in some cases can occur, um, often it, it's, it's best to allow uh, for the training and all that to occur to um, you know, have the best implementation and not uh, add one more thing, if you will, to the plate uh, of our hardworking teachers in, in the classrooms. Okay, so to clarify, it, it wouldn't be implemented for a year anyways? 
any if the board were to adopt, uh, adopt something tonight then then uh, then that would be we would be prepared to implement next fall um, but if the board w uh, chooses to um, not uh, adopt now we go back to the review process that process because of the extensive involvement in piloting would take us a good part of the year so we would not recommend implementation for a following year so if we were to start back at square one mm -hmm. Square one would involve a committee, including parents, to look at all of the different choices and to decide which choices will then be piloted? Uh, correct, and we can uh, re-provide re, uh, to the board and we can also put on our website the curriculum review process that we engage in um, so that everyone can see all the steps involved. And so from my direction, I hear from the board is, um, you know, re be, restart, you know, would on this motion, if it were to pass, is to restart the process, including parents on the committee from uh, first first step through all steps. And so that that's what we, we would do. And um, and we would uh, also um, you know solicit you know involvement of staff. Some may choose to continue, others may may be new. Um, and and so that that would be the process we would look to do. So in the interest of not rushing the process just to get to um, a new curriculum and taking our time to get to the right curriculum, I will second Trustee Sadoff's motion. And in the interest of us following our ed code that says that we need to promote um, our members of the community in the selection of instructional materials. So is this a roll call? Um, so the motion on the table is to not adopt um, the current science amplify, amplify, amplify science curriculum. Uh, first motion put forth by Trustee Sadoff, seconded by Trustee Hupp. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Callisto Zorales. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Michelle Sutherland? No. Julie Hupp? Yes. Motion passes. And now on to item 10. Rockland Unified School District grade nine through 12 silence pilot and adoption recommendation. Marty Flowers. As I get set up here, I, I see we have some guests from Whitney High School. The question is not the score of the basketball game, because it was a fundraiser. The question was, does anyone know if uh, Principal Collins dunked? Because I know that's something that he was really working hard to do, because he wanted to impress his student body. Well, no, he's going to do it in warm-ups. I'm not sure, but uh, hopefully. But uh, yes, what an exciting night for them, and great fundraiser. So, yes. <clears throat> when you get a certain age, any dunk counts. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, with that, um, President Hupp, Trustee, Superintendent Stock, I come before you this evening with the 912 uh, science information item. Uh, presenting with me this evening, I want to take a second and just thank him and her for their work in this. Uh, you see, uh, my friend and colleague Bill Kimmel will be help presenting. Uh, hopefully, he's still here. Yes. Um, with that, it does say uh, Science Department Chair. Uh, but when we started this process, Mr. Kimmel was actually serving as an instructional coach in the area of science. So he still helped start this process, but he's been a science teacher in Rockland High School for 28 years. And he's a very humble uh, gentleman, but he's known not only in our district, but in our county, and is even presented at the state level. So he, I would consider him my expert in science. So with that, um, when he went back to the classroom, our program specialist, Ms. Amanda Bannister, took over and led the process and has done a great job. So I want to thank both of them for being here this evening. With that, just a quick overview. Uh, similar to uh, previous presentations on curriculum, we'll talk about the adoption process. Uh, this is the first time at the secondary level that we've looked at open educational resources, and we'll talk about that. And part of that is, is the cost. Uh, but we'll go over that. We'll review the committee work and the recommendation. We'll review the public uh, review process, um, and then next steps. 
With that, uh, again, you've seen this slide before. The state of California has a schedule to update curriculum frameworks that typically takes place around every six to eight years, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. From that, publishers then use the state frameworks to create the curriculum. You can see there that the State Board of Education adopts K-8 curriculum to meet the state requirements. However, in 9-12, they do not adopt. There's just simply too many courses too much curriculum at that level. However, they do expect that, um, that uh, lead educational agencies, districts, follow a very similar process. And again, that's where I want to thank Mr. Kimmel and Mrs. Bannister for the work they've done to ensure that we have followed that process. Um, with that, school districts then uh, look at an adoption cycle every six to eight years. Um, they do extensively review the curriculum using the instructional materials. Uh, such as the toolkit and the framework, and then they make recommendations to the trustees. With that, you can see this timeline, and uh, I will say that, that unfortunately COVID and the sub shortage really uh, stopped this. But not only that, when you, you can see there in September of 2013, the State Board of Education adopted the next generation science standards. It took them a couple years actually to work around all the details in that um, and bring forward um, the frameworks around that, and again, you can see there that they adopted that for public schools for K-8. Again, they do not adopt uh, instructional materials for 9-12. From that, uh, Rockland did participate in training, and there were a lot of questions around really the credentialing. As you know, at the secondary level, in order to do that, you have to have a single subject credential. So we have teachers that, that went to college and graduate studying science in this case, or a math teacher, a math credential. Um, so they did go through trainings and they participated in that. Um, and then in December of 2020, not to read all of them, we identified a science committee. We started that work. We started looking at those open educational resources, utilizing the toolkit, and then the pandemic hit. So that was stalled, uh, unfortunately. That's the, uh, when Mr. Kimmel said, all right, that's enough. I'm gonna go back to the classroom full time. So he went back and Ms. Bannister took over. Uh, but we resumed this work uh, this year uh, looking again extensively at those open educational resources. Our neighboring district, uh, high school district, all they think about is high school. Uh, and they, they've kind of touched on this and took off with this. And we'll talk more about that here in a second. Uh, we come here tonight to, as an information item, just to show the, the work. Um, the plan would be to open up a public review process uh, through May and then again come back June 7th with a recommendation if approved at that time, then we would move forward with ordering and, and training and kick the uh, following school year off with this material. At this time, I'm gonna ask my good friend, Mr. Kimmel, to talk to you about open educational resources. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, to start off, I would say, uh, actually, I'm actually nervous about this because I'm passionate about science. Um, in the collaborative nature, it works better for me if you ask questions as I go. So I. I think that's a good start. I do have some thank yous. Uh, and this is another thing I'm a little bit emotional about, but I'd like to thank the board and uh, Mr. Stock for approving my kids to be on inter-district transfer to Rockland, and my last kid graduates this year. And it's been an incredible experience for me as a parent, uh, but also as a teacher. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, along those lines, I also uh, thank you for Give me one last opportunity to get science curriculum approved before I retire. So if this goes well, which I'm not sure how it's going right now, but we'll see. Uh, this will be my last uh, science curriculum adoption. Um, and then also thank you for getting me out of the basketball game because I definitely would have been injured. <laughs> uh, so I I'm actually super excited about the concept of open educational resources. I think it's... Uh, an opportunity to save district money. Um, basically what it is is uh, the, in secondary science there's, we get these textbooks and they're all very similar. Like all the publishing companies will have a textbook that is very similar. They cost as much as two to three hundred dollars. The open educational resource, the content is very similar. Um, but it's free. So that opens up this opportunity instead of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to actually buy curriculum. Um, okay, ask me a question. <laughs> is, is, is more from, a, I guess, elementary, is mystery science an open 
education resource? Uh, I guess another, just, uh, I, I don't even know if this is appropriate for me to bring up here uh, in this, at this spot, but I guess another thing that I'm a little bit just nervous about is even as a teacher talking, because I think there was a lot of things that were said in a lot of previous session, and this is a different session, that was factually incorrect. Um, and so I don't even know if I am allowed to comment on something like the mystery science. If I am, I, I, am I allowed to make that comment? Is it, even though it's yeah. a different session? And, 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 so I, well, is, I would think well, if we could stick to maybe as question, like if the question is, is mystery science, is that an example of open education resources, or is open education an actual organization? What I would say is, is uh, the open educational resource, the one that we're uh, looking into today, is an organization. Uh, it is a nonprofit, and they develop the curriculum. As far as something like the mystery science, which is uh, would include a primary level approval by the state, as far as I know, that's never been board approved. So that is a curriculum that we're using that is not either approved by the state or board approved by our board, by you. Thank you. So I have a question. I. <laughs> Being an elementary school teacher, I've never really understood what the open education resources is. Is it a, a framework and you have choices within that framework? Or I, I don't really, can you explain a little yeah, bit how so it works? It basically started as, a, as a, text, a textbook written by teachers and professors. Um, and then recently it's become like with CK-12, which uh, Arnold, uh, our, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a governor said, hey, textbooks are too expensive. Mm -hmm. So he, from what I understood, did the seed funding for CK-12. Um, a lot of homeschool and uh, districts around the country are using open resources because of the cost. Uh, and since the content, especially in secondary science, doesn't change all that much, the phenomenon do, but the content doesn't, uh, those textbooks have been available for a long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, what CK-12 does is aligns it to the NGSS curriculum uh, and then also makes it modern and digital. So you could, we could hand students PDFs of the text. But I have my phone book. I go to a site. Yeah. I'm looking up chapter five. Not so even better for the, the, the one that we're proposing, it's integrated with Schoology. So as a teacher, mm, I can nice. just click, I want you to read wow. this page. That page shows up in Schoology. Uh, it can have... Uh, it has the opportunity for the students to ask questions uh, or answer questions. Like as a teacher, I can quiz them on that. So, kind of this, the 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 other thing that's very different about secondary science than uh, the elementary science, which includes um, a kit. So you'll get the content plus the kit. In secondary science, they don't sell uh, kits with the curriculum. It, uh, so all the textbooks that we've adopted, we've never done this process. Uh, it, we've literally taken a textbook, brought it, and sat over there in the corner and said, look at it for a month. Um, so to do this process with a rubric, we're looking at all three dimensions of NGS, NGSS. So we're not just looking at what we call the disciplinary core ideas. We're also looking at the practices, so the investigations. Those we have to build for ourselves and secondary. So all the labs and experiments, those don't come in a box or a kit. Mm. Yeah, so we, um, it, the, these open source textbooks are content only. So it's the description of the actual core concepts. The investigations are developed by the teacher. So uh, kind of following the, what Roosevelt has done in most of the districts in this state, the teachers are still developing the labs. So in the curriculum that we were showing to you tonight, Whitney and Rockland together developed all the labs and activities uh, for each of those different items. And so those will have equipment costs and all those things that, we, uh, that have, uh, were addressed in the earlier session. But those are labs and investigations and activities that have a separate cost than the CK-12. So in terms of adoption, we, um, for all content areas, we used to just adopt the student will learn. So 
we wanted to adopt a textbook that said the student will be able to know this thing. Um, and so that, I think, when you were talking about the history of adoption, it, the textbook was not really learning, and it wasn't really curriculum, it was really content. As that changed, now that's kind of the history that's, that's happened is all the content standards has moved, have moved from the student will know this to we want students engaged in practicing. So for language arts, we want them to engage in argument. We want them to be able to make uh, claims and evidence and reasoning. And the same is true with science. So in NGSS, now there's this component of science that also includes practices. And that's like something we've never adopted. So I'm really intrigued by this. Um, well, first I have to say, I love when you talk about engagement because my son actually had you as a teacher and you were so engaging and he loved your class. And I remember as we were even going over his course load, he didn't require that class and he begged to be able to have it because he knew you were a phenomenal teacher that kept the class engaged. So thank you for that. So I think you're the perfect person to be standing up here right now. Um, I'm very intrigued by um, this open education resource concept of how this would work in a preview process for parents. So um, the digital content could be customized. So when you say like Whitney and Rockland, I'm guessing you guys like kind of picked like, here's what we would use, but then can you use, can a teacher use any open education resource? How does that play out? Well, so again, this is new. Yeah, I know. This, so uh, what we did is we took the aligned curriculum and we said, okay, what parts of this match up with the courses that we have in our local environment? Which is a four, four courses that I'll, I can show you these four courses. Um, so we took the CK-12 content and we looked at those four courses and said, what, what, what matches up with the standards that we're teaching in these four courses? Um, and then we, we just eliminated stuff that, was, that we're not teaching. So we take the textbook and just virtually go like this. Um, and then we lock that. So now my assumption is, is that the board will come up with some sort of policy that says for things that are electronic, we'll lock it. And then if there's something that, they, it, a huge advantage of open source is that it's, you can update it. So when we buy, you know, when we're, if we're using a textbook that's 2008, um, it, there's factually incorrect information in there. And that's, you know, a problem if we're using curriculum that's that old. Well, this could be updated that year. So we would have to have some sort of approval process that says these are the updates. Um, textbook companies do this already, and we never come back to the board, but they're always things that we would say are, you know, not substantial. So it'd be grammatical errors. We have in the past had to remove things that the law changed, and we had to go in and actually physically remove things from textbooks science textbooks in the past because they became in violation. So we have had to make changes before. We, as far as I know, when a change happens, we've never had a, a process for saying, hey, these are the changes we're making. Well, we so changed this, the population of the earth from you know, 7.5 billion to 8 billion. Now it's When I think that's great, right? That they'll be able to have that capability. It's yeah. not like, oh, you have to buy a new updated edition or textbook. Um, and I really like your, the locking process. I think, you know, I'm thinking from a parent lens of if I'm going to be a part of this process to help you know, really look at this, oh, what am I looking at? So I'm assuming we would give them access to everything the teacher would have access to. And then anything that's not part of this curriculum development process really wouldn't be utilized. Is That's what I'm hearing, that's what you mean by locking? Yes. So this is where I am, you know, in talking about parent involvement, something like this sounds amazing. You're able to customize it use what you feel aligns with the standards and what you want to teach. But I think it's really showing some glaring limitations to the level of parent involvement that we're talking about right now. And so to say that each district board shall promote the involvement of parents and other members of the community in the selection of instructional materials, great. That's pretty broad, though. So then we have parents involved in choosing the curriculum and then do we also have parents involved in what gets taken out and what gets locked in? And then when it's updated, do we have to do a new process? I'm 
I am concerned about the impact to our students' education because of this, and I think when it comes down to it, this is related to the FAIR Act. We didn't even talk about options for our last curriculum, Amplify, that our teachers painstakingly reviewed and piloted. And now here we are with Bill Kimmel with his expertise so that he can tell us about this. And bottom line, we're going to say, nope, not good enough. I, I, I guess I didn't get up to make a comment about the we way are now I've having always our read the process because I appreciate what you're saying. And I've always read the process, and I understand the, the rule there is that um, I think what you said earlier about the transparency is the key thing. That as a district, I think the, the science has made a commitment to we're not going to hide anything. Like, I think it's really important for us not to hide the, what is being taught and hide the curriculum from the parents. Mm -hmm. And to me, you get to approve or, or not approve. So, and I think the parents should push you to approve and not approve. That that's part of your job. So, absolutely. I read that raw law and the rule as absolutely we have to make sure that we're transparent and we're showing the parents every little detail and that they have plenty of time and every opportunity to see everything and make their comments and then push you, which is the hard part, to make a decision based on that. As far as and I, I would like to go back, but I, I actually think that we did involve parents for both K-5, and I know we did for 6-8 for um, the adoption. So I, I, in the back of my mind, I'm going back five, six years, that I remember going to William Jessup with parents and teachers. Um, and then along that, like our committee, um, I think of the 20 teachers that are in there, 16 have students in the district. So they're, 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 I, the transparency is the key and the trust is the key. But to assume that they're, the teachers that are involved are not also parents is, is that's not true. They're, they're, well, and they the, are parents. So, that are and the um, comment trustee, that didn't sit I just well. want to make sure we're staying on track with um, Mr. Kimmel's presentation. I don't want to make him responsible uh, for the uh, presentation. Tell me to Absolutely. Stop I'm not no, no, no. I, I, this I, is your time. I, it's like my last time. Probably yeah. in front of the board, so I'm doing things I probably shouldn't do. <laughs> You're, in, you are. in respect to what you are presenting now, and just knowing based on the previous items conversation and how this is likely to go, I do just want to put that in everyone's mind that you are the expert presenting this with your expertise and the process and talking about that. And you did mention, and we allowed you to mention about the, amp, um, the mystery science that's being taught has not been looked at by us, has not been put forth for the parents to review, and we're okay with that. And we didn't even want to talk about the other options that we had with Amplify. And so, so again, okay. I want to make sure okay. we're giving Mr. Will, Kimmel his time. And, and, I really do want to hear yeah, everything he board, has to I, say. I don't think it's fair to, to you as board members also to be held accountable for something that was done in 2013. But even in 2013, we did come to the board with this is our adoption schedule, and we did t tell the community and the board and invited people to participate, including board members. And we've had board members uh, participate in adoptions before uh, for either individual textbooks. And we, we it's, the process is, is you know, we, we have talked about it. Like that, I guess I get a little bit emotional about it because I played a role in it. And I know that I did, was here standing saying, this is what we're, our plan is. We are inviting the community to do these things. Um, and we're going to do the same thing with, with the secondary science. When, when I came up in front of the board and we talked about the 6-9 science, and there is stuff that, you know, there's always going to be people that approve and, and don't approve, and the same thing will happen with our curriculum tonight. Um, we want to make sure that we're being transparent, that every parent, every teacher, and every board member feels like they're, they're, they're not being tricked. Like that, I think that's the most important piece, if we're transparent about that material. So we will do a parent night. We will show the curriculum. It, instead of the book sitting in the back where one person can see it at a time, we're going to make it digital for all parents to see on their own time. So we want to make sure that, that those components are because that's important to me too, both as a parent and then also as a teacher. I want people to believe in the curriculum that we're, that we're mm -hmm. using. So, I, and I will say that there's, 
this is me personally, a textbook is never, it's never the teacher. The textbook is just this tiny, tiny little component of quality learning and a quality educational environment. Um, it's not the most important piece. Uh, it is a piece that's necessary, it's a really important piece, but the textbook we're asking you to adopt is not perfect. Uh, of all the ones that we looked at that cost $300, those were not perfect either. Um, you will not find a textbook that students love, uh, parents love, or teachers love. It, those don't exist. And, and that really goes for all curriculum. Okay. So, Can I ask a question yeah, right now? Yeah, of course. Open, one more question about open education resources. It makes it sound like it's Wikipedia. Is it open and people can add their opinion about science? Uh, uh, so in this case, there's others that are like a single professor. I had open educational resources even as a college student. Okay. A professor would write a textbook and make it open to all, mm -hmm. everybody. This, this company, is this CK12 nonprofit has created open educational resources. I could go edit that. Now we've locked that where I'm not gonna go edit it without your approval, but um, you, may, you may find something, we, like we feel like we've read every page, but we may find something that the wording's off or, or that could be expressed in a different way. We found things that are, not, that's not lo no longer best practice to teach it that way. So we remove those from the textbook. So, so talk me through how that would work in the future. Say we're two years down the road, right? And we've got all these people teaching it, what would it look like? Uh, so, as an example, again, this is something that we don't always talk about in secondary, but this is an education for all of us. I, something you said earlier kind of got me teary-eyed again, but... Um, that's because you have a child that's a senior, and we just cry <laughs> yeah. the whole year. Uh, it hit me really hard that there was a 13-year-old boy that died mm -hmm. with a TikTok challenge of Benadryl. So, that is a phenomena, and if I am not bringing that up in my class, I, I, don't know, I don't know that I want to be a teacher anymore. Um, but that would be a great opportunity to talk about, talk about what a toxic dose is and a lethal dose and, and how an individual chemical may have impact one person different than another. And we may decide we want this as a unit. Like this is a super important topic. It fits in with right. our, so we would write pages. And I guess, depending on what the board decided, you would say, bring that for approval and then we would incorporate that into our lock textbook. Interesting. That's that's tricky. I mean, I love the I love your idea of what you're saying, but we have teachers use stuff and add supplemental material all the time, right? So where's the the line in that? Yes, I mean we we know, and and and, and actually, uh, President Huff and I have had conversations just as as a teacher about this over over the years of of just that teachers are always looking for how do I bring in the best uh, to, to our students and, 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 and use supplemental resources on a regular basis. I, I, I can't think of a teacher, myself as a teacher, or, uh, or teachers I know that aren't constantly doing that. That's why like Teachers Pay Teachers websites exist and things. And so what, what we do have in our, in our board policies is that the board has adopted guidelines for um, the use of, of, of supplemental resources and also, you know, when anything may be a sensitive topic to, uh, you know, give that guidance to teachers because we, we know that, that 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 reality is, you know, you may have, it may have been like you see uh, an article about an earthquake in Tibet and you want to use that article, you know, from... from the, some, the new science the, standards actually require us as science teachers to be, to use local and relevant phenomena and timely. And so when there was fires in paradise, that becomes part of our curriculum. Uh, it's built into the structure of NGSS that we do those things, that we try to make it as engaging as, as much as we can for the students because it's local and timely and relevant. Uh, the guidance piece is important because right. yeah. that makes everybody feel comfortable about what they're doing. Um, but you, it, to me, that has to be part of a quality, you know, educational excellence. That has to be part of what we do. Interesting, I'd say we, we, we have teachers um, here that you know using the guidance we have in our current policies bring in supplemental resources daily regularly um, and 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 we we and that has worked well for our students for our our our, our teachers and, and our community because again we 
and know that they there's so much out there and, and we we trust them to follow that policies we do annual training on sensitive topics at the beginning of every year and and we uh you know you know work to put that in place and and, and i think that that gives teachers that flexibility to bring in the local phenomenon to bring in a current issue of say you know the tragedy of a student with a TikTok Ben drill droves to be able to talk about that given the context uh you know of that and and really we're in that that seems to be the best match because we typically bring in a, a, an adoption every seven to ten years a major adoption and we know that that, that things evolve and, and and we want that uh and, and so that's worked well and and, and that's something that you know our current practices provide for and allow for uh in our district if i could just add though uh with this being the first time going through this process uh, again, uh, Bill talked about locking that, mm -hmm. that flex book. Mm -hmm. So anything that came out from CK12 that's new edition or updated, uh, we would not have that in our textbook. The thinking being next year, we would look at how many things were upgraded, how many things were added, does that fit to this flex book? And if that were the case, we would bring it back and really kind of update our, our book. Because when you think, I use the analogy of buying a car. As soon as you drive off the lot, that's old. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, that's the, the benefit about having digital textbooks is we can bring it forward and update it without having to go and buy a whole right, brand right. new textbook. So yeah. that's the benefit. Right, right. So in this case, we, by locking that means that like, it's not like Wikipedia, that anybody can go in and add that, that when the board concern. votes to adopt a, a, a book, that they know what they're adopting. Our community does, as, as Mr. Kimmel mentioned, in, in the transparency. It doesn't preclude, say, if there's a relevant article or video about the Benadryl, that Mr. Kimmel could bring that in using the current practice, practices policies we have, because we would absolutely want that. Yeah. So, so that's yeah. that distinction was we, we didn't want to say that, that it's like Wikipedia, it's constantly changing, the board adopted it once and had no idea what's going on, but, but that, that we lock it in that essence, and then if there's additional updates, things like, say, the population of the world changed, um, which it did during this presentation, um, that, that, it, that, it, we, that that could be brought in as that in that supplemental process. So we want to provide that flexibility, but also know when the board adopts something that that's what's adopted is, is, is locked in essence, but it also does allow for that, the supplemental process for folks to bring in things is, the, is, is needed. So quick question on the CAST exam that occurs 11th grade? And so then, that was another thing that was just a little bit... I'd love to give the history of this, okay. but the, we, as far as I know, we have never had actual meaningful cast data because of COVID. So we've had tests, but we haven't had a full cohort of students that we could match up with uh, previous data. And so the, the three-year block of, of teachers, so three, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade, they get tested on a cast test. The sixth, seven, eighth, that's another group all together are tested on all the disciplines, science disciplines. We at the high school level, it's the same. So we'll get tested uh, for our high school students, and we, we still have some decisions as a district to make about that, but we'll be tested on all four of the content areas, the physical science, life science, geological, geological science, and um, the physical science has two parts, chem, uh, the chemistry and the physics. So the CAS test, this year at Rockland High School, and I think it's the same at, at Whitney, all seniors took that test. This will, should be our first meaningful set of data. Um, and that, partly my opinion, but partly because it took the state that long to get it together. Um, but then in the future, we'll also have data either from sophomores or juniors. So it, it, when, the cast, when CST tests went away, as science departments, it made it really hard for us to know the level of performance that, that we are achieving as science teachers. Now, Rockland was always, both Rockland and Whitney were all these highest Excellent. performers, and it was really nice to brag to other districts, but um, without, without that meaningful course data, we, we don't have that. All right, so we're here to ask you to adopt this, uh, or, or information, to be information that, that we're presenting this as um, uh, to, the, to you in the community. Uh, we have a, the website. We have a uh, May 10th a parent information night uh, where we'll, we'll invite the community to come see the curriculum, um, to engage with it, to see 
The other things that we didn't talk about that we're asking for is um, a, uh, a simulation software, software called Gizmo, which will take especially the, some of the really difficult physics concepts along with some other um, simulation software that is also open source and free. So that's part of what we're asking you to, uh, we're asking the community to review. And um, so that's also part of the, this curriculum that we have for you. And so that gives me that, that's a free software and then is, or no? That, that's a cost to it, okay. There, one, one set is, um, is free, it's called FET. And okay. it's, it's used by teachers all around. Um, the other one that we're asking for, that does have a cost is a different product and that's Gizmo. And we'll, we will present that. It will ha it's already up for everybody to see, but we'll also have the opportunity to show it to parents and let them engage in it. Go ahead. Bill knows that he's one of my favorites, one of my kids' favorites. Um, I really do want your opinion on this. Knowing and hearing how our board feels about access and transparency, how would we move forward considering the things that we've talked about, wanting to have parents involved in the selection? Did you guys look at several curriculums or you, were you really looking at this as, hey, this is a really great option and that was all that you looked at? Which either answer is totally fine, I just, honesty. Uh, so uh, Mr. Flowers mentioned earlier that secondary is a little bit different, mm -hmm. that there's no board approved curriculum. Oops. So they're, uh, for state board. State board approved curriculum. Yeah. So, um, we saw the, all the textbook companies put their materials at William Jessup. We looked at all the materials. Um, the cost is actually almost at our budget without any equipment. Um, so we, we knew that Roseville had actually engaged in looking at CK-12 and there's other districts doing the same. Mm -hmm. um, we did the rubrics for, uh, okay, so to go back on the process. Um, Thank you. A, a bunch of teachers, along with uh, Kathy Pond, uh, we went and got trained on the process for, for identifying uh, quality curriculum. And so we went through that training, and then we used that training to what's called pre-screen. And the pre-screen process is you just go through and you say, does this match your, the components of your district? And it includes you know, local, um, local concerns. So we go through that, and that pre-screens the set of textbooks. And then from the pre-screening, you can, there's a bunch of different processes that you can do. Um, many districts will just pilot a single textbook. If they like it, they'll bring it to the board and the community. Sometimes you'll pilot multiple textbooks. At the secondary level, some of the pilots are paid. So you have to pay for the pilot, which makes it really cost prohibitive. It, it better be something that you really are feeling confident about. Um, so anyway, we did that process. We did the pre-screening. We, we uh, decided this, what we would like to have is more hands-on equipment, uh, more um, actual scientific engagement, and the textbook was less important to us. Uh, and so you want to spend your money on that as well? So. On the equipment. Yeah, so, so in order to make that mm -hmm. happen, one possibility, it may not be the best textbook of all textbooks. I'm not. I'm not coming to you saying this is the best textbook out there, but this is a textbook where the content is accurate and it's at a, you know it's 99 percent the same as all the other textbooks that are also out there. But with that gives us the opportunity to do the, some of the other components of NGSS, which is the um, really deep scientific practices. So when I think of science, it's the textbook is just really one third of that. Um, the other two thirds we've never adopted, we've never even talked about, but those are the, the things that I think engage students. Um, the third one that is what is called cross-cutting concepts, and that's really the importance of having some sort of coherence in the spiraling, spiraling of the curriculum. So from kindergarten to 12th grade, there's this expectation that uh, topics and content and investigations will be repeated all the way up so that maximizes the learning. So in what we do, we have to make sure that, that that's improved. As far, yeah, as far as the second part of your question that I didn't even get to answer, I'm sorry. That's okay. Is if you were asking me on the earlier topic, 
I, what I would have said. On this topic, on though. This topic. Yeah. I How do we. The most important thing is, and you may say this not, you may decide that this is not good enough. The most important thing is get it out in front of the teacher and the, and the parents and the board. And if that takes an extra X amount of weeks, uh, and they come back and say, yeah, you know, we really don't like it for this reason, um, that's okay. And, you, and I would be comfortable with you voting this down and say, you know, we're, for all the things that you talked about, we still think that there's better, um, there's something better, we want to go a different direction. But I think the input comes from the, um, the transparency and making sure everybody feels and knows that there, there's no hidden agenda. I think if everybody feels and knows there's not a hidden agenda, then a lot of the, the tension will disappear. I think the tension comes when maybe somebody feels like, you know, I don't know which one because I'm both a teacher and a parent, and, but, you know, what is my agenda? I want to make sure that that is not a component. I, by letting you have as much time as you need to, to see the curriculum. Thank you. I really appreciate your perspective and even what you just said. Like, I, just how you worded that, I just, I just see such beautiful unity in that, right? Of saying, hey, I want the community to come together and celebrate something, great. Right? And things might not be perfect. There might be things people don't like, right? But I, I, I think there's also kind of like a, a threshold line, right? Of like, are we crossing the threshold? What I'm kind of thinking when I'm looking at this review process, I want to set us up for success, right? I don't want to bring you back whenever yeah. we come back and then also surprise you as a board member and going, well, wait, why didn't you share that sooner, right? Um, secondary and elementary are two different beasts in my mind, right? I love that we're a unified district, but I think it's important as trustees that we do acknowledge or recognize when there might be a tweak to a process or a difference of a process, right? Um, I'm, I'm recognizing in this, right, we're talking ninth through 12th graders, just making sure I'm accurate on this, right? This is open education resources for ninth through 12th grade. That is very different to me than, you know, third through fifth or other grades that we might be looking at. With that in mind, I'm trying to see how we can work together to, I still would love the opportunity for some parents from the community, and I fully hear you on, many teachers are parents as well. Um, I also think there's value though. It's hard to sometimes separate those hats. For example, if I went to a committee, as much as I would say, hey, I'm there as a parent, I'm always gonna be there as a trustee, right? Like that's the reality, that vein is in me. And so I'm wondering if there's a way in this process so we can set you up for success, and this is one trustee talking, but maybe there is um, either before a 30-day public review or I would maybe tolerate talking about during the public, public review, but I would like for there to be something where the committee you have, a couple parents are invited to come sit on that. Um, we actually did that for the health committee and actually Marty Flowers, it was under your direction. That was years ago. That's actually where trustee Price and I first met. Gosh, what, eight years ago, 10 years? I need to look at the date. We always throw around numbers, um, but it's been many, many years. Um, and I think there was great value in that. And you know, we sometimes had to meet more times. Like I think we thought we were only gonna meet once or twice and we had to meet more. So I just wonder if there's a way we can add that into this process. I know I would feel more comfortable if we did. I, I think a good spot for that would be um, if it matches up, ours was specifically a science rubric, but the pre-screen process, at least have an opportunity to see what's out there, um, would be a good, that would be a good spot for it. Uh, Cause that determines what you're going to pilot is the pre-screening. Um, so in that spot, that would be a really good spot for, and, I, and a, again, I'm, I'm sorry that for my memory, but I think we did that for, for K-12, that we included parents in the pre-screening. I'll have to go back and check, um, but that was one thing. I'm like, I know we did for 6-8. Um, I'm pretty sure that we did it for K-5, for the pre-screening. Now this is years ago. Uh, you know, they, they, you know, this was our, our, this, these standards were adopted in um, 10 years ago. So that's when we started the process. So it, it seems crazy, but 10 years ago is when we started this process. And there, so the information that passes through and the things that we presented on changes quite a bit over that 10 years. And I, and I do also want to just be super um, consistent in being transparent. 
what we're talking about right now are the four core NGSS courses that are A through G approved um, that get tested on the CAS test. Or we have not had a conversation about all the other subjects, like the other subject that I teach. And we have never done, I'm, I'm just being honest, we've never done that process other than uh, public review. So public review has been the, the community input. But this is important because it is the ones that match up with, um, like Mr. Cannon was talking about, the, the CAS test. So, and the A through G requirements. Yeah. So we're looking at, so it's the Flexbooks, which is it's cool. The Gizmo and FET, that's I think the software. And then as far as the lab component, yeah, so, and, and all, I mean, the microscopes, all, all the cool yeah. stuff that you guys do. So uh, we did actually, was that, you go ahead and want to talk about that? Well, this whole presentation is going to change a little bit, but yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, one of the things I want to make clear, because I, I, I believe what Bill is saying about being transparent, and I want to go back in that a little bit. Uh, when we open the website and make that available, you'll be able to click on all these. These are the ones that, that the first time uh, teachers from Whitney and Rockland have worked together to where we had a teacher uh, from each school work and look at biology. We had a teacher from each school, and it was great collaboration because they were bouncing things off. As Bill mentioned earlier, uh, historically, we've done very well in science. We have a lot to be proud of there. And they were sharing experiences because they do things differently, yet the, the results are still the same. Kids in Rockland have been very successful. Uh, with that being said, with this process, it was a very tedious process. Again, all the work that our teachers did, and we had to add days. There was eight, ten days. Um, this is something that at the elementary world, publishers go through, and they go through a lot of that process to ensure that it meets the requirements for the state of California. Um, so, so when we start looking at this, we feel that this is a better process by going this. It's going to allow us to spend the dollars on some of those supplies and things to make those classes engaging because, again, the reality is the use of the textbook is, is, is I think, uh, Mr. Kimmel said a third. I'm not even sure if it's that because it's really the experience of those experts teaching that. With that being said, again, I want to make it clear that all these uh, books that you see here, they have links. You could literally go page by page, go through each unit. And then in addition to that, you have um, this that's really kind of like a course uh, breakdown of everything they're going to do. These are also live links. This is the example, I believe, from uh, biology. You can click on those. You can see exactly what the kids will be doing. And, and uh, again, the great thing is this is the experts from Whitney and Rockland working to create the best um, uh, course to meet the needs of next generation science standards. If, if we were choosing a different textbook, we still would be bringing this component, which we've never brought before. And before, we would have asked, we would have taken um, a materials request for a course and said, we need this. But it was never approved as part of the curriculum. So now that it's part of the three components of the NGSS, it is part of what would be included in an adoption. So with that, actually, Mr. Kim was so excited he took my slide here. Sorry. Uh, but again, what we will be doing on June 7th is bringing back um, a recommendation to accept uh, the open resource material. That will include the Flexbooks. Again, those are free, standards-aligned, customized digital textbooks. It includes simulations, the Play, Learn, Interact, Explore, interactives, adaptive practices, integrates into Schoology, as Mr. Kilmo mentioned. Um, it'll um, include the teacher design, student experiences, simulations, and again, it does meet those uh, standards so kids can be very successful on the CAS, and not only uh, that, but college and career ready. Um, Again, I think uh, we've, there's been a lot of discussion about this next slide. Uh, you made it very clear with that. Uh, what we will be doing, unless directed otherwise, is I want to make that available and make it known. It's, it's actually in my following slide here. Um, the website's going to go on the web page. Uh, parents will receive that email that that's available. They will have all digital access to all that curriculum, plus, uh, plus the unit descriptions that I just showed you. We will be doing a high school science curriculum information night in this boarding uh, room on May 10th from 6 to 7. Not only Mr. Kimmel, but other teachers, teachers from uh, Whitney High School as well. Because again, we want to open it up. We want parents to come in. Mr. Kimmel will walk through the website at that time. He will also have the 
Uh, we'll have Chromebooks here, so they're available. They can look, and if necessary, we'll even make sure we print out some of that material. Because there will be, in order to meet the Williams, we will make sure we have some printed materials. We want kids to have access 24-7, and if, if there is a kid uh, traveling or anything like that, uh, that for whatever reason don't have access to the internet, they'll still have that printed material. But again, there's a huge savings in that, because we're not spending $300 on a textbook. It's a minimal cost to print that. And most kids will access this digitally. Uh, again, we'll have some feedback available on that website, and then we'll answer any questions. And once again, most importantly, we'll be bringing this back on June 7th, which leads me to my next slide. We'll make any necessary adjustments, as I just mentioned. Uh, we'll be back on June 7th. And then if the curriculum recommendation, recommendations are approved on June 7th, uh, we'll purchase the materials, have it delivered to the sites, we'll provide that professional de development, and we'll start the year off uh, with new curriculum for 9 through 12 science. Just real quick on, on, you know, assuming all that works out and goes through, there's no lead time issues with any of the stuff, right? I mean, it's all software. It's once you buy it, you pretty much have it in an hour type thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So when will this be available to the public? Uh, we can make it available. It's ready to go. We can make that available tomorrow. Uh, we will send the email out, again, per uh, direction to the families of Rothman Unified. We will have it on our district webpage available. And we'll also, as we historically have done, uh, we can print out some hard copies here. We can also have Chromebooks here available if parents would like to come in and, and see that. And we can do additional. We I heard the request that we send written uh, letters home. We can do that to every high school student as well, just to ensure there's a paper copy of, 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 the, of the email so that we can uh, cover all the bases we can, and, and we'll work to um, do additional. We can also send out additional reminders uh, that, that, that the resources are available, because we, we, I definitely heard the board's interest in making sure there's multiple uh, avenues for uh, informing the, the parents of the opportunities to review. So we're okay with the standard timeline to make sure that our high school students get new curriculum by next school year then. Okay, cool. I mean, I'd say I'm okay with this timeline as long as it's, you know, we have the opportunity to hear from parents. I mean, if there's extreme concerns, then I think we have to reevaluate if more time's needed. But I think hearing that secondary is different than elementary to me, I'm okay with moving forward. As far as printing out a physical paper for every single high school student, I, I heard you in that. I want to make sure, because I, I, when I was saying that for elementary, third through fifth, I was thinking those are just students in that class. Um, my colleagues, is that something that we could maybe get a follow-up or talk with Roger or Superintendent Stock on how we can increase outreach? Any ideas in now you, you share or in later would be great. And what I meant was beyond just an email that we had, um, like a let, like the letter would be given to students to take home. That that's what I meant um, by every student. It was just because every student takes science in, in 9, 10, 11th grade in, in our high mm -hmm. schools, which is different. Some of the other courses, like Mr. Kimball mentioned, are elective courses. Um, so the end idea would be that our ninth, 10th, 11th grade okay. students would be given, and also 8th grade, because they'll be going into high school, uh, be given a hard copy so that in case you don't open our email, even though we think you should, um, that you, you have that as well. And if there's other suggestions, ideas, um, absolutely we'll work to incorporate that. Thank you so much. The only other component that I think is important is on the website, along with all three levels of websites, So when we did parent uh, meetings on N NDSS and how it is different, and um, that that's an important component. We didn't talk about it as much today, but science could and is different than it was with the last one. So that has nothing to do with adoption, but it has to do with the fact that the way that students are learning. So is there a part that would that parents would want to see particularly that has that in there that we could maybe link to when we, we send a, an email? A whole, a whole tab on okay. the website that yeah. talks about Perfect. shift, like what an instructional shift looks like. Perfect. What, what you should see, what you should hear. Okay. You, you may, your sons and daughters may come home and say, um, what's the evidence we have for that claim? <laughs> uh, so there may be a little bit of frustration there, but. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kimball. I also want to shout out to 
Ms. Bannister, who's still here, that took over the process. Thank you very much for your expertise. Thank you. And just to not uh, be excluded, uh, my son was in your class and loved your class. <laughs> and that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we will move on to 10.2. Um, Mr. Flowers will now ask you to present item 10.2, the world language pilot and adoption recommendation for French. Okay, President Hub, trustee, Superintendent Stock, I now stand here by myself uh, <laughs> to talk about world language, uh, specifically uh, French. With that, very similar, so because of time, I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly. The process, the world language, French adoption committee work and recommendation, the review process I think we've talked about, and then next steps. Again, exact same slide. Um, the state adopts K-8, not 912. Uh, we are dedicated to doing that process. And, and again, Ms. Bannister did lead this and has done a great job. Uh, with that, here's the uh, adoption timeline. Uh, State Board of Education in two, uh, excuse me, 2019 adopted standards. The frameworks came out in 2020. We identified a World Language Committee um, in 22. We started that work uh, on training on the standards and the framework. We evaluated the instructional materials. Uh, we piloted uh, this year, and I come before you tonight. Again, the plan would be to open this up. Same, uh, same website, same thing, just specifically with French. I will talk about that in a second, because Spanish uh, was also involved in this process. However, teachers from Whitney, uh, Rockland, and our two middle schools, because students can't earn uh, Spanish one credit at the middle schools, so we had four specifically at Spanish. Uh, they could not come together and find one that they felt was adequate, so they've actually decided to go out, and they're currently piloting a third one. Uh, my hope is that we will get that process completed and bring it back later uh, with the goal uh, potentially bring that as an action item uh, beginning of next year, uh, possibly. But again, I, I want to give a shout out to our Spanish teachers. They could not come together to decide on one, and we said we're not going to rush it. We want you to uh, go out and find the one that best meets the needs of our kids. Uh, so with that, I'm here tonight uh, solely with uh, French in mind. Uh, again, the committee work, they did a one full day of training on the new standards and frameworks, two days of extensive review of curriculum options, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bomb this, I know, but I did go to Mr. Reno because uh, I did not take French. Uh, Shamaz, uh, if anyone in the audience knows how to speak French, help me out. Uh, Shamaz, uh, that's the one that they identified. And again, they piloted this year. They're very excited about that, some of the uh, integration with technology. With that, here's an example of it. We will also have this available digitally just on the website, just like uh, we've talked about uh, in regards to 912 science. Um, I'm going to go right ahead and skip this slide. Uh, I think we've talked about this extensively. Um, and then, again, the website will go out uh, tomorrow. Um, it'll have the same material. It'll have some of those new uh, frameworks and standards in the area of world language. A lot of people still refer it to as foreign language. Actually, part of that is that we refer to it as world languages now. They'll have the digital access uh, feedback on there, and then staff will be available to answer questions. Uh, again, very similar. Next steps, come to the June 7th meeting, uh, looking for an approval of, of that. If approved at that time, we will order those materials. They will be delivered to our sites. We will provide professional development and then ongoing support uh, with our PLCs. And again, just a shout out to the teachers. Uh, uh, the collaboration between the two schools, um, this is something, um, you know, it's been a while since we've looked at world language and adopted a new curriculum, and it was great to get those teachers together to work. Any questions? For sake of time and people in the room that I'm assuming are waiting to make public comment, I appreciate you. I would say my comments um, to the previous would apply to this as well. Um, as much outreach as possible, increased outreach, um, increased parent participation. Um, and again, I do see secondary and elementary very different, um, but I wanna make sure we're still looking at that parent involvement piece here and making sure that we are actively engaging parents. If we're not getting parents involved, we need to, we need to physically get on phones or find a way to make sure we get some parents involved. But thank you, um, I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, we will now move to public comment. Um, and just as it says on the board, please turn in a public comment card if you wish to speak on non-agenda items. When you're called up, state your full name, the city you live in, and the school your children attend. All comments must be addressed directly to the board. The first 10 people will be allotted three minutes each, and each person after that will be given one minute per person on one agenda item. One agenda item? One non-agenda item. Time cannot be yielded to anyone else. The board is not permitted to deliberate or take action on non-agenda items, but may refer the matter to a staff member for follow-up. Comments must be respectful and professional. Please, no profanity. I will say who's up and who's on deck. We have had a few people leave, so um, that might be need to be taken into account. I have here first William McEnroe, and by the way, I apologize ahead of time if I say anybody's name wrong. <laughs> and on deck will be Amber Barak. She left. Okay. So next on deck will be Kelly Davenport. Thank you for allowing me to, to return to the present, uh, to present, present some questions that I have. My name is Will McEnroe, and I live at 4908 Eldon Drive in Rockland for the past 34 years. I have both my daughters who have attended, and now my granddaughters attend the Rockland schools. I'm here tonight to question the increase in earnings of the staff of the Rockland Unified School District Office and how it appears to be affecting supplies and programs of the students. The student population of the school district has dropped to 11,404, yet the number of uh, superint assistant superintendents rose from two to four. At the start of this, every school year, the schools solicit from the parents support for supplies, not only for their children, but for the school. This appeal goes on all year. In fact, a teacher sent out an email to the parents after only 100, on uh, the 100th day of the school year requesting classroom supplies. Another fact, a home ec economics instructor charges $20 for the classes for supplies. Still lacking funds went to sponsors to provide those funds. My research shows that in 2021, the superintendent and the four assistants earned, including benefits, a total of $1,269,422. That was an increase of $56,942 over the previous year. The information from the wages of 2022, including benefits, was not available. Why is this increase for 2021? Couldn't some of that money be for salary increases have gone to the funds classrooms so the parents wouldn't have to? Perception, they say, is everything, and the parents might not like the perception that the district salaries are given priority over their children's classrooms. Given the current student body of 11,404, the cost per student is $111.32 just to pay the superintendent and the assistants. While the students are doing well in their studies, not every student is, bound, is college bound. Programs that would benefit students wanting jobs not requiring co uh, college educations have been cut because of lack of funding. Case in point, Rockland High School canceled its culinary program for this reason. The superintendent's uh, stock salary with benefits increased $42,678 from 2017 to 2021. Ms. Patterson's increase from 2017 to 2021 was $61,399. Mr. Lin salary rose $18,377 from 2019 to 2021. Mr. Flowers rose $40,000. $523 from 2018 to 2021. Mr. McDonald's increased 28,690. Mr. McEnroe, thank you so much. That's your time. Thank you. We appreciate you coming here tonight. And after Ms. Davenport will be Celeste Rogers. My name is Kelly Davenport. I'm from Rockland. I have two children in the Rockland School District. Um, a senior at Whitney High School and a freshman at Whitney High School. Um, we are here today um, to appeal for this issue to be put onto the agenda for a future board meeting. Um, I represent clearly Whitney Wrestling. Um, 
I know it's late at night, and I'm going to read just some excerpts from a letter that I had crafted. I had, hadn't even decided where it would be sent ultimately. Um, but our program is working really hard at the school level to get some traction for some needs that we have. Some of the statements in this letter are purely meant to be educational about what this excellent program is up against, despite the success that they're having. So um, let's see here. Uh, we are contacting you today as parents of two Whitney High, Whitney High School wrestlers. Our senior, Shane Davenport, is extremely involved in the program, having wrestled varsity each year and serving as a two-year team captain, and now an assistant coach for the Cats Club program. As parents, we are grateful for Whitney Wrestling and all that it develops in these athletes on and off the mat. The coaching staff is so hardworking and dedicated, tending to every detail that the athletes need to, be, to prepare to succeed. The program has been building steadily and brought home numerous titles and achievements this past season, despite competing in the very competitive SFL League and division. It is impressive and exciting, and I can't wait to watch the promising future unfold. Despite all this good, it's been disheartening that the program has had to work extra hard amidst significant adversity. Whitney Wrestling has been resilient, but is operating in a space of desperate needs. All athletic programs have safety requirements that are non-negotiable, and they generally happen scheduled, they're, I'm sorry, they're generally scheduled to ensure player safety. Football helmet recertification is an example. There's a timeline by which helmets should be recertified, and it is not up for discussion, and rightfully so. It is disappointing that, the common sense, that that common sense approach has not appealed to all the programs. Wrestling has been using the same practice mat since 2005. The warranty expired in 2015, so after 10 years, the mats lose their shock absorbency. The program should have been provided with a new practice mat in 2015 and should be due to receive the next one in two years. This is a negligent delay in providing proper equipment. The practice mat is a safety hazard and truly cannot be the same equipment utilized for the next season. Let's skip ahead here. Um, the equipment update would be a great step in the right direction. However, the conditions in which the mats are utilized are a major risk as well. Um, neither Whitney or Rockland have a wrestling room, but every other school in the league has a wrestling room. And we're performing extremely well relative to the competition. Um, the team cannot stay healthy, safe, and compete with the caliber of these teams while training in our currently provided conditions. Um, we practice in the cafeteria. It's unsanitary. Um, given the volume of students that move through that space, they interact with our mats. They sit on them. They press food into them. I wish I was kidding, but I'm not. Um, and simply the fact that our mats can't be displayed Kelly, I'm sorry, your time's up, but thank you so much. We appreciate you coming. So next is Celeste Rogers, and on deck will be Jason Pappas. Good evening, I'm Celeste Rogers. I live in Rockland. I have a sophomore at Whitney, obviously involved in the wrestling program, and I have a seventh grader at Granite Oaks. Um, I would like to start this off with the highest praises that can be given for an athletic program at Whitney High School for wrestling. I'm usually quite the talker, but it's actually difficult for me to put into words just how much this program has meant to my son and, frankly, my entire family. What Coach Perez, Coach Parker, and Coach Ardito have put into this program is well beyond what I would expect of any high school athletics coaches. The amount of time and heart they put into these young men and women is something to be celebrated and hopefully mimicked in other sports programs at our school. I believe we all treat this program as if we are family, and that sense of community and belonging is crucial to the positive growth and development of these young people in the program. My son has gained such a sense of confidence and self-worth, and I know many of the other wrestlers have had a similar experience. Not only that, the kids have one of the highest GPAs of any athletics program that I've heard. Combined for both men and women, it's 3.62. Not only are they strong, they're incredibly intelligent. I don't know if I even have to mention the accomplishments the wrestling program has brought to the school, but I will anyway, so you can understand the importance of the program. Last year, we had our first ever California CIF state champion for the school, ever. And that's obviously huge. This year, we've had two wrestlers earn the title of 2023 SFL champion. Not only that, we had a record number of our wrestlers earn the way to masters, which is the Sac Joaquin section championships, if you're unfamiliar with what that is. Anthony Berg brought home the championship for that uh, just this past February. Uh, we had three make their way to state, and Alex Madej brought home fifth place. All that being said, I have some major concerns with where we're headed with the program if we don't get a dedicated space in which to practice and mold future champions. The fact that we don't have a dedicated wrestling room is simply put embarrassing and a huge disappointment. 
of our entire SFL league, Whitney and Rockland, are the only schools that don't have a space used just for wrestling. If I'm not mistaken, we're actually adding a couple schools to the league, which would be Jesuit and David and Davis, and you guessed it, they also have de dedicated wrestling rooms. Every time our kids have practice, the kids have to roll these mats, clean them, roll them back up afterwards, and quite frankly, it wastes valuable training time and energy. I don't know if you've seen these mats, but they are in our cafeteria. It's disgusting. This is where our students eat. Kids are constantly walking around and eating on top of our mats that are open to the public and not contained safely to avoid this type of behavior. Some of the mats get damaged by the kids ripping them, putting food in crevices, etc. Ask yourself if you'd like your children to be wrestling on that filth, and I think you would certainly say not. It's quite disappointing not to mention that I think it'd be violating some sort of health code. With these mats being rolled and stored where they are currently, they're a petri dish of nasty fungi and festering bacteria. Disgusting. The mats would match, last much longer if they were in a designated area free of abuse. There are multi-purposes. Celeste, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Up next is Jason Pappas, and after Jason will be, I, I'm going to butcher this, Manuel Ingres. Oh. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Jason Pappas. I'm a resident at Rockland. I have students at Quarry Trail Elementary, and my eldest is a uh, first year student at Whitney High and a member of the Whitney High School wrestling team. I'm here tonight to request that criti uh, a critical topic to be added to the agenda for the next board meeting. As a concerned parent and advocate for the health, safety, and well-being of our student athletes, it is vital to discuss the issue of inadequate equipment, care, and maintenance of the practice mats of the Whitney High School wrestling team. As we all know, the athletic equipment used by our student athletes is essential to their performance and safety during practices, matches, and tournaments. Unfortunately, there have been reports of insufficient care, storage, and maintenance of the equipment, which has resulted in some athletes being exposed to unnecessary injury or illness, and others exposed to unnecessary risk of injury or illness. This is a matter of great concern that requires urgent attention from the board. The Whitney High School wrestling team stores wrestling mats and holds practices in the school cafeteria. The school cafeteria is not a secure room. The entire student body, as well as school visitors, always have access to this room and wrestling mats during school hours and extracurricular events held in neighboring gyms. As a result, mats are improperly used, abused, and food and drinks are often spilled on mats, which has led to early degradation. At this point, the mats have dead spots and are unable to be thoroughly cleaned and sanitized. My son has personally suffered two head injuries requiring doctor visits for mat contact and has suffered two rounds of ringworm requiring multiple rounds of steroid antibiotics and topical ointments, leaving his body scarred, as have other Whitney wrestling members. I'm very aware of the inherent risks of wrestling. Head injuries and ringworm are two of them. If Whitney High School had its own secure wrestling room, up-to-date practice mats free of dead spots and the ability to properly sanitize, like most of our neighboring high schools, I would not be standing here before you. It is the responsibility of the school district to ensure that our student athletes have access to safe and well-maintained equipment. Therefore, I urge the school board to add the following topics to their agenda. Number one, the current state of wrestling equipment at Whitney High School. Number two, the risks, hazards, and liability associated with poorly maintained equipment at Whitney High School. And number three, strategies for improving the maintenance of wrestling equipment at Whitney High School, including safe storage, budget allocation, equipment replacement, and regular inspections. Addressing this issue will not only protect our student athletes from harm, but it will also demonstrate the district's commitment to their well-being and success. Thank you for considering my request and for your dedication to the safety and health of our student athletes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is Manuel here? Okay. So then we will hear from Allison Abbott and on deck, Pete Constant. Is Allison Abbott here? She left? Okay, Peter. After Peter will be John Munoz. Good evening, board. My name is Peter Constant. I'm the student body president at William Jessup University. Uh, I want to come before you guys to thank you guys for having your district participate in our local high school leadership conference uh, that I invited to about a month and a half ago. 
Um, and thank you, Derek, uh, specifically to you for hel helping me get the contact information and reach out to the schools. Whitney had a really strong presence at the conference and it really uh, made a difference. Uh, some of you guys' leaders are very impressive and we can't wait to see what they do in the future. Uh, as this conference continues to grow in the following years, we look to add Rockland and I believe uh, Victory High School to um, the mix and to continue to bring schools. We had about nine other schools um, from two other districts, uh, Roseville Joint Union and Western Placer there. Uh, and it was great to see all the students uh, interact like we, I talked about to you guys. Our goal was unity between uh, different schools and school districts. And it was uh, a really impressive showing and to show the, how strong these students are and what their desire for high educa higher education uh, as well as uh, interactions between other school districts. It's really promising uh, as we continue to do this year by year, and we cannot wait to invite you guys and give you guys the dates for uh, next year's. Um, this is uh, Laura Everett. She's gonna be the student body president next year, so she will be taking uh, over and uh, doing this conference next year. Um, with her goals, uh, we hopefully want to continue to grow this, and I want um, her to be able to build a relationship with the district as I have been able to this year. So thank you to the superintendent's office and the board uh, for making this a priority and having uh, one, one of your guys' schools uh, be there. We look to continue to grow this. So if you have anything. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for your support for this year's conference. Um, my goals for next year include just building off of what Peter and our current administration has currently been working on. Um, so I'm excited to see how our partnership can continue to grow so we can get um, our current and future leaders um, more developed in their leadership skills. So thank you. Thank Would you mind repeating your name? My name is Laura Everett. Everett. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, up next is John Munoz, and after that will be Travis Mojet. Uh, my name is John Munoz. I have two, uh, two boys who attend Whitney High School, uh, and both on a wrestling team. I have some concerns that I want to address for safety for, uh, for all the wrestlers. Um, Uh, it seems like the wrestling team has just been pretty much ignored or forgotten when it comes to safety or even acknowledging the accomplishments. We've had a state champ last year, no recognition until somebody started emailing and saying, hey, you have a state champ, and finally somebody said something. Um, and that, but that's, that's huge. Uh, shouldn't have had a, no one should have had an email and, and say anything. But he's back to the, the safety right now. Our kids don't have a wrestling room. Cafeteria, it's nasty in there. Uh, there's food all over the mats. There's and these boys, they wrestle any sport. They spit, they get cut, they bleed, they throw up, and then other kids are coming in there and they're eating in this cafeteria. So I don't think those families would like or appreciate their kids eating where all this stuff is uh, going on. That we were offered a uh, a I guess modular or something for wrestlers. It was turned down. Not even an option. Not. There's no discussion about it. It's just shut down. That was it. Um, everything that we do, we raise money ourselves. Most of it's just through straight donations. Last year, I donated $600 myself out of my own money. Us as parents should not have to do that. Um, the school, we pay taxes. We have all kinds of stuff, you know, money coming from everywhere. Football team gets, you know, uh, new scoreboards, new, uh, you know, fields. Same thing with the baseball, basketball, everything else is, seems like it's sponsored well, but wrestlers, we get nothing. Everything just comes straight from the parents or the kids. Um, I'm since retired, I can't give that kind of money, nor should I have to. So, um, you know, this is why, why we're here, because it is a big deal that they do need their own facility. The girls need their own facility, and the boys need their own facility. Um, Again, the mats, 17 years old. They're wrinkled, they're torn. You cannot clean those things enough um, for these kids not to get, you know, to avoid MRSA or any of this other stuff. And it wastes a lot of time. You're looking about 40 hours to 50 hours per season that we're wasting rolling up mats and cleaning them. And it, it's, again, it just shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that way. So, uh, again, I'm just, asking that you guys really take in consideration that these kids be treated like they should. Every other sport gets what they need. 
and here our kids are just, we're just barely getting by. We raised $10,000 last year, and we ended up having to use it for mats ourselves because the district refused to, to pay anything. So I see my time's up, but thank you. Thank you very much. Can I uh, make a comment after this? I really appreciate you guys coming and waiting so long for us to get through our business um, so that we could hear your public comments. Superintendent Stock, could you um, help us as board members um, address some of these concerns, especially when we're talking about safety? Um, yes, I, I mean, absolutely. We can uh, take a look at the, the safety issues, especially around, uh, you know, with the mats that were mentioned. Like, you know, for example, we do on like the football, the turf fields, we have concussion protocols that we test. We can absolutely make sure the mats are, are meeting safety protocols because we, we absolutely, you know, want that to occur. Um, the other piece is related to that, like uh, adding additional facilities. Um, our, our school district, uh, like most school districts, we have a facilities master plan, and that's updated about every you know five years or so. Uh, we're the, we're in the process per the, per the board direction to update that facilities master plan, and so we've, and that's a a, a little very year long process, and we've uh, you know had uh, teams of you know engineers, architects out looking at what are some of the facility needs. And in their compiling a report, we'll have uh, different processes to, to receive some additional input. One of those is, of course, uh, this will be discussed by the board in, in a couple different uh, board agenda items coming up. So um, the, and this is where the uh, Ms. Phil facilities master plan looks at the entire district's needs, and then they look at each school facility, uh, each school campus uh, for their unique facility needs as well. And it takes a look at all those, there comes in, uh, cost estimates and so all those pieces are included so the in that process is underway and we anticipate that coming back coming to the board for discussion at a board meeting um, yeah, sometime yeah, this summer uh, most like or, or early uh, next year it'll be publicly agendized and we can reach out to um, you know people that have an interest to make sure they're notified of when that discussion is occurring but that's when we would uh, is, is the board would be uh, scheduled to take a look at what our facility needs because um, I have no doubt uh, the these are, are sincere needs that were expressed tonight and that we also would have other sincere needs expressed mm -hmm. at other schools as well and that way the board gets a chance to look at look at all these but as refer as specifically to that the mat and the safety regarded to that um, we will definitely work with staff to look into that and report back to the board regarding the, the safety and conditions of that piece of equipment. Thank you. In, I, I just want you to know that we hear you and we appreciate you bringing your concerns and that safety is a value of ours. And I also knew that this master you know, facilities plan is coming. So we will be taking into account the information you've shared and the feedback. Thank you. I would like to add on to that, though. Um, I, myself and I believe uh, Trustee Counter are sitting on that um, committee for the master facility plan, and I look forward to that, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I would like to set a, a faster timeline, though, on addressing this specific concern, because I, I recognize that there are some long-term concerns and long-term facility for competitiveness, and I think that's a, appropriate to look at at that time. Um, however, it was a previous meeting, I believe either a month or two ago, where several individuals came with concerns specifically related to the same concerns. I know multiple trustees reached out for an update on those concerns. Um, I know I myself did get an update back in March, um, specifically about um, the concerns of safety um, and our response to that regarding the WHS wrestling. Um, and then in addition to that, um, the water bottles, which I know weren't mentioned tonight, but they were mentioned before. Um, I thank our staff for addressing the water bottle concern. Um, however, um, it sounds like there is still a continued concern. And I know the update I received was that there were not safety concerns for um, WHS wrestling. Um, but it sounds like um, there are still continued concerns. And so how, uh, Superintendent Stock, can I go about um, getting a timely update um, before the next board meeting regarding specifically the MAC concerns that were mentioned? Um, uh, next board meeting scheduled two weeks from now. We can work to uh, look into that, uh, say that Matt, and look regarding the uh, safety piece of that, uh, and I'll also share with the board possible replacement costs and and to look look at all those pieces. So we can do our very best in the next two weeks to provide some of that information to the board related specifically to the Matt. As far as to the construction of new facilities. Um, at the school, that really um, is the process that typically, and again, the board is welcome to change the process at, at any point, any time, but that's typically the process we look at to identify 
what additional facilities are needed, what repairs are needed, what are the priorities uh, related to that. The board, um, part of the board uh, work in that uh, master plan development is prioritizing uh, the types of categories for uh, the, the expenditure mm -hmm. of dollars related to facilities. And, and, and so there, there's a you know, deep, deep conversation regarding to that. And so that would be that, that typically that process. We're scheduled for the board subcommittee to take a first look at the draft plan before it comes to the full board. I believe that meeting is set for May, um, but and in, in, in that was uh, set a couple that was set a couple months ago in consultation with our, our consultants and with uh, you and Trustee Counter on the subcommittee. And so we're we're working to do that. And once that's completed and your comments are, are put into that plan. Uh, then we would bring it to the full board. We're actually meeting with secondary principals for their input to the plan next Tuesday um, from 3.30 to 5, and then we'll be doing a similar process with elementary principals as well. So uh, because it's such a comprehensive document and we updated it approximately every five years, we, we really take the time to go through thorough input and opportunities to make sure all needs are, are addressed so we can work to look to move that up uh, sooner. But um, the other pieces that we have found in previous facility master plans is that we there are, um, unfortunately, millions and millions of dollars of needs. And then, the, diff and then the, the task really is to how do we find the funding to fulfill those needs um, within that. And so that's part of the conversation as well, where the board is uh, identifying needs and looking at prioritization, looking at possible funding pieces. And so. Um, you know, so that that's what we look forward to bringing back to the board. Um, and but we will look into the map piece specifically and the safety regarding to that specifically outside of the facilities master plan update because that would be more of an equipment. And piece. I would like to add into that um, safety and um, I don't even know the correct term that would be used, but when they're multi-use or they're in environments that are multi-use, I think that could present other issues. I don't know if items like that typically go through the athletic director or through the school site principal, um, but if we can get an update, um, or at least I don't know if my colleagues feel the same, I would love to hear an update on that. I understand construction has to go through the process, but addressing the MAC concern. Right. And just so I can uh, make sure I uh, understand the interest is, I mean, and actually our athletic programs, we have phenomenal athletic directors that are high schools that work with their administrations to supervise and, and work with resources uh, at our high schools. But uh, just to make sure I understand the, the follow-up information, is specifically obviously the MAP piece, we, we've heard that, but then you'd mentioned multi-use facilities. Can, can you uh, clarify for me a little bit more of exactly the information you want so we can gather that? Yeah, meaning in relation to the mats. Um, you know, a, a, as a parent, I'm thinking, I, I could see both sides of that issue, right? A wrestler on a mat um, that is maybe in a multi-use environment that's not stored. Um, I heard concerns maybe not being stored, I don't want to say appropriately, but I, I heard concerns about that, and I want to make sure that specific specifically is addressed. I know last time I thank you for the update we got, but I don't think I was specific on the mats, and I think tonight I heard a, a legitimate, immediate concern regarding the mats. Right, so regarding storage and care in, 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 uh, of that equipment is... Yes, okay, yeah, great. and then specifically the other way too, if um, students are in competing on these mats, but then they're stored in an open food environment, I, I would have concerns in that direction as well. Great. We'll work to provide thank that you. information. Anything else? Um, I think we had one more comment. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, up next, Travis. <laughs> That's okay. It's, I don't think it's about wrestling, so. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna segue a little okay. bit. First, I just want to give a huge shout out to the the people that stayed till now to have their comments heard. Um, so part of my comment, um, I'll start with the wrestling side. I'm gonna wear two hats while I'm up here. Um, Tiffany, kind of to address, I know we can't deliberate, but just to address some of the the things you were just mentioning about. We got two weeks till the next meeting. How can we get some more information? I would encourage you guys to reach out to Coach Perez because youth wrestling is still going on at Whitney High School. Go see what the environment looks like. See what the, the youth coming onto our campus, what's their first impression of wrestling in Whitney High School if that's their niche because it looks a little bit different than when you get to walk into that stadium for football game, soccer game, the pool area. It just doesn't have that wow factor and I think that's a big part of it. There's that perception reality piece when we're trying to draw kids. We keep talking about enrollment in our district. I think that might be something worth seeing with your own eyes. Um, to the to the, the other piece I wanted to address that um, isn't my original um, content, our comment intent was, uh, we're talking about mats and sanitary and safety. There's uh, the same argument when we're talking about equity can be made for the cheer mats. They're right next to the wrestling mats. The same exact reality happens to those as well. Kids climbing on them, food in them, all the disgustingness that you can imagine around that cafeteria space. 
and then a different set of students using those mats as well for competition and whatever else similar to a wrestling mat. So just again, while we're, we're broadening that topic of safety, I think it'd be worth looking at. Just look at the cafeteria space. It's not just one program um, that you're going to see similar concerns and problems with. Um, kind of my original reason for, for putting it for public comment is um, I know in the past, and I know for reasons since the past, we, uh, we used to have public comment at the first part of the, the evenings, and then we flipped it to the end of the evenings. Um, I'd like to just make the suggestion, maybe we reevaluate that choice. Um, a big part of it is if we want students to be available to do this, it's 10 o'clock. And I know not all of our meetings go late, but it's also not unheard of that our meetings go late. Um, you know, we had college students able to stick around the night. We had a lot of parents, a lot more parents that we're, we're going to hear comments from, but just weren't able to stay for their various reasons. I think just something to reconsider is as we look at when public comment happens and kind of that process, maybe we try to find a different way or, a, you know, we adjust it with our rotation of our, uh, the length of our agendas and we kind of can predict those and just give the community more opportunity to get up here, especially since we've removed the, the written comment element that we used to have when we made that adjustment originally. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Travis. So item 12 on the agenda uh, is pending agenda items. Trustees, do you have any items that you would like to place on the pending agenda? I'd like to add an item, actually. Um, I think that we could use a conversation regarding our board policy 6161.1, selection and evaluation of instructional materials as we talk about encouraging or involving or including the participation of parents and how we want to do that moving forward. I'm okay if you guys want to do that May 3rd. I'll be gone at a conference. Um, if we could put it on the 17th, that would be great. But if you guys, you know, if it's more pressing for the 3rd, I trust you and I can call in if necessary. So either either one. Uh, Christy Price, would you like that helpful? as an information or action item? If we're amending board policy, does it, does it have to be an action item? Uh, no, you, you can discuss the policy, but you can't take action on it. I, I, you can discuss it if it's an information item, but can't take action on, action on it. If it's an action item, you can always discuss it and not take action. Yeah, so let's make it an action. Okay. Yeah, and I'd like to second that. And I was just going to say, I think we've had a lot of conversation the last two board meetings surrounding this topic. And I think I actually think it'll just give good clarification to, to staff in the district. And so the, there's not confusion on that point. So thank you. Uh, I was going to say Rochelle, <laughs> Trustee Price. <laughs> Do we need a vote, or is that just two people uh, no, make it so? No, a foreign corner bylaw, uh, 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 one trustee with a second can push, place something okay. on the agenda. And I, I heard May, May 17th, if that works, is an action item. Uh, we'll bring back uh, that policy. Great. Anything else, trustees? Nothing? All right. Then the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>